Here in Shropshire is a farm that's frozen in time. Lost in Victorian rural England. Now a unique project will bring it back to life, as it would have been in the 1880s. Such an amazing piece of cake. That is just <laughs> tremendous. Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn are taking up the challenge of living as Victorian farmers for a full calendar year from the depths of winter to the warmth of summer. They'll wear the clothes, eat the food, and experience the day-to-day -day life of rural Victorians. They'll rear Victorian breeds of animals. They're an unruly bunch. They really are. That's the first lamb you've actually delivered, is it, Alex? Hello, sweeties. They'll grow crops. Fingers crossed, I'll get it right, and I won't look like too much of an idiot and get to grips with the crafts and skills of the age. This was a time of agricultural revolution in Britain. But the industrialization of farming would wipe out centuries of traditional skills. Go, go, go. Where are you, Alex? Good grief, young man. Thankfully, there are a select few who still keep them alive. And this is going to encourage the tree to fall in the direction we want it to go. That's certainly the theory. With their help, the team are about to turn back the clock to rediscover a lost world. <laughs> But first, before winter sets in, they must restore their dilapidated farm cottage. I've never used anything like this. You're an excited lady, I love it. I know, I, I have. It. So crops using only horsepower, whilst dealing with the perennial problem of the British weather. Unfortunately, it's just not working out for us today. The problem is, is it's just so wet. And take charge of livestock, learning shepherding skills the hard way. A nightmare. This doesn't bode well for the year. They'll be getting to grips with every aspect of life on the Victorian farm. It's the 1st of September. Ruth, Alex and Peter arrive at their Victorian farm. This is the way to travel, isn't it? I know, it's fantastic. Ruth Goodman specialises in domestic history. She'll run the cottage and be responsible for the dairy and poultry. The Victorian period is, is a really, really interesting moment in history. It's a, a time of the most enormous social change. There's new ways of feeding ourselves, there's new ways of clothing ourselves, there's new ways of housing ourselves, there's new ways of transporting ourselves. You know, we all base our modern living on the things that came out of this great turmoil and experimentation. What's in this one? Oh, this is mostly cooked gear. Things, utensils. Yeah. Archaeologist Alex Langlands will be responsible for growing crops and rearing the animals. It's about getting up first thing in the morning um, and coming in, you know, when the sun goes down. It's about spending the time outside. It's about e eating fresh ingredients, uh, growing your own ingredients. I mean, it really is about going back to a way of life that I think many people today would love the opportunity to do. Peter Ginn, also an archaeologist, is keen to get to grips with the steam and horsepower technology of the era. We all know about the big events in history. I want to know about the day-to-day -day living within that context. There are massive changes in industry and also there are massive changes in agriculture. Because it's such a moment of change, you've got the old and the new sitting right alongside each other. So you've got ancient crafts that are almost unchanged for a millennia, sitting right alongside a time of mass production. Their farm is on the Acton Scott estate, which stretches across one and a half thousand acres of Shropshire countryside. It's been home to Thomas Stackhouse Acton's family since 1255. Mr Acton is a Victorian farming enthusiast and has spent his life collecting old agricultural tools and machinery. His son Rupert manages the estate and will be their land agent for the year ahead. Goodness. <laughs> Just a bit daunted. Yeah. You ring the bell. <laughs> First stop for the farmers is Acton Scott Hall. It's it. Hello. 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 Nice to meet you. <laughs> How are you? Very good indeed. Hi, I'm, I'm Peter. Peter, nice um, to meet this you. This is Ruth. 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 Hello. And, uh, and Alex. Of course, I'm Alex. Yes, yes. excellent. Hello. 
Hello. This is, uh, this is little Florence. Hello, Florence. Little Florence. Florence. <laughs> She's rather shy. <laughs> In the Victorian age, this was a busy working farm with 15 acres of land. Mm. Wow. It was abandoned 50 years ago, but little has changed here for a century. Oh, it's quite a sight, isn't it? I'm afraid so. This is yes, a cow shed. Oh, wow, look at that. Let's see whether that's uh, done it. All the stall. These barns will be home to their cows, horse and pigs. Yeah. Needs a bit of a clean. It is going to need a bit of a clean, isn't it? Yeah. Home to hundreds of spiders. Although abandoned long ago, amazingly, the Victorian water pump still works. I spent uh, many happy hours here as a child pumping water for the, for the cattle. 13 better days. <laughs> Above the cow shed is the tool loft, untouched for decades. Now be very, very careful. There's a, a good range of tools. For... Oh, fantastic. God, look. This one is a castrating knife. <laughs> that's lovely. I think that's definitely a boy job. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know it's a milking stool. No other stool is that high. I mean, it's absolutely perfect, isn't it? Or, or has three legs. Or has, yeah, yeah. exactly. There's uh, some horse medication up here as well. You've thought of everything. It's not still in there. Well, no. The bottle's still sealed. The uh, one-minute cure for gripes or fret in horses. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's still sealed. Oh, flipping heck. Wow. There's so much here, Work. so much to take in. This place is amazing. It was almost like it was left yesterday. It yeah. Is. Well, OK, so... a long, slightly rusty <laughs> yesterday. But... Time capsule that we've just uncovered. <gasps> With everything here, we've just got to get it back in shape. Make it easier to get to the door. The team will not just be farming, but also living, cooking and eating like rural Victorians. Yes. Interesting colour. Rupert has found them a small farm worker's cottage, uninhabited since the 1950s. I believe one of these keys fits this door, but I'm not quite sure which one it is. So you feel like keys. you've got a key when you yeah. get a key like that, don't you? <laughs> oh, there we go. Ah, uh -huh. there we are. Wonderful. Oh, wow. Fantastic. <laughs> In need of a, a bit of uh, work, I'm afraid. I take it this can't have been lived in for quite a while. No, it hasn't been lived in for 50 years. Yes. 50 years. Yes. At the heart of the Victorian cottage is the coal range. This was the way most people cooked until the 1920s, when gas and electricity began to replace coal. It's not only essential for cooking, but provides hot water and heats the house. But this range is in a sorry state. We're going to have to get this sorted absolutely first thing. We're just not going to be able to do anything until we've got a decent range. I mean, the rest we can live without, but yeah. we can't live without the range. I'm worried about cooking on a coal range. I've never done it before. So that's going to be quite an important thing for me, because if I can't crack it, we're going to eat horrible food all year, which is not very nice. So, shall I uh, show you upstairs, yeah, show you where you'll be billeted? Although dilapidated, the cottage is structurally sound. No, it's not too bad up here. I think it's pretty good. He, he says, a good shot of the dead birds from the window sill. Right, that's it. Moving in, as <laughs> soon as possible. Guiding the farmers through the year ahead is the celebrated Book of the Farm by Henry Stevens, first published in 1844. This kind of book, I mean, it's, it's absolutely priceless. and It gives you a breakdown about ev essentially everything you would need to do throughout the year. And it also gives you the science behind it as well, all types of breeds. I mean, there's literally absolutely everything here. What is most interesting about these publications, though, is their mixture of the old and the new. It often refers to sort of ancient ways of doing things, but without quite knowing the exact science behind it. This was the Bible for farmers coming to terms with the industrialisation of farming in the 19th century. It's also got the new as well, some of the sort of cutting edge technology of the time. And I'm just looking here at some of this um, ploughing with a steam engine, with these huge cumbersome steam engines, but seen to be, and it says here, absolute cutting edge technology. Turning this theory into practice will be an enormous challenge. 
One of the tasks I've been uh, trusted with uh, throughout the project is going to be sort of managing our arable concern. It's, it's really a part of the project where I just can't afford to fail. And of course, for farmers back in the late 19th century, it's just not an option. You know, I'm really, really anxious about it, but at the same time, really excited. The farm has three acres of arable land. On some of it, they hope to grow a cereal crop, like wheat or barley. At the moment, the field's covered in grass, so first it must be ploughed to return it to bare earth. Guiding Alex is Britain's most award-winning ploughman, Jim Elliott. Hi, Jim. Hi, yeah. And who are these lovely fellas, then? This is Lion. He's an eight-year-old shire. Right. And uh, this is Prince. He's a 13-year-old Irish draft. And they work well together, then? Yeah, yeah, they do. So what do you think of the field, then, Jim? The field looks fine. Um, quite a bit of grass on, but we should be able to plough it down and, and put a bit of fertility into the soil. You're say. confident? Yeah, as long as there's no big stones. Good, I'm glad you're confident. Two back, Prince. Two back. Oh, whoa, whoa, slowly now. This really is your money maker. Um, this is really important, especially for a farm of our size. You've really got to turn out a good cereal crop because that's really, that's where you're going to get your cash. During the 19th century, the population of Britain grew from 10 million to 40 million. To feed the masses, agriculture had to undergo a revolution by industrialising. Simple wooden ploughs used for centuries were superseded by high-tech iron machines. Leading the market were ransoms of Ipswich. In the 1840s, they came up with this, the Yorkshire Light. So great was the design, it was still being manufactured a century later. Fantastic bit of kit, this is the Ransom's plough, and this is one of these mass produced ploughs. What you have in our sort of, in the sort of earlier period, earlier 19th century, is you've still got your wooden ploughs and they're being made in local workshops, but with Ransom's mass produced and they're being sent out to all over the country. So you'd be using one of these north of Scotland, all the way down south of England. These high tech ploughs revolutionised arable farming. The earth was ploughed to a consistent depth improving the quality of the land and increasing the crop yield. But in much the same way that you see a, a modern tractor. Go on, Prince. It's got Prince. all sorts of gadgets on it, you know, hydraulics, levers, all sorts of it. It's very much the same here. Boy. Having to Boy. adjust everything just by very, very small fractions of inches. At the cottage, Ruth and Peter are beginning the restoration. Oh, let's get rid of these birds first. The first job is to clean the bedroom. It's in a pretty neglected state, this room. Um, the walls, the plaster's there, mostly. If we just sort of start at the top and just take it as slowly as we can down. This has been 50 years of dust, 50 years of spiders, 50 years of an insect and animal paradise. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely filthy. This is, I think, a much bigger job than I thought initially. As they remove half a century of dust, the state of the plaster becomes clear. The plaster's not as good as I thought it was. It's going to take quite a bit of... Well, if it needs to come off, it needs to come off. I think the more we look, the more we're finding we're going to have to do. Downstairs in the kitchen, there's an even more pressing issue. The range. So this is Henley Cottage, and this is our range. I don't know what you think about it. Peter's called on Paul Arrowsmith, an expert in Victorian building. Yes, yeah, could be repaired, but it's a big job, not, isn't it? Not worth it. It's a very small opening, though. Do you need to do much cooking? We need to do a fair bit of cooking, yes. All um, oh, right. Oh, no, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is actually the original fireplace because we've obviously got this here. On the adjacent wall is evidence of a fireplace bricked up long ago. Only the wooden lintel is visible. So it's a, a lot bigger area, so I'm sure it goes back further so you can get a much bigger range in. I suppose the only way to find out is actually to get rid of some of this stuff. The old range will be discarded and a new, bigger range installed here. 
Peter is hoping that beyond the rubble, the chimney will still be intact. Henley Cottage hasn't been used for 50 years, and moreover, this is a bricked up chimney. Um, so this is all rubble that has been used to fill up this fireplace when it was abandoned, and then moved across to there. To burn, the range draws air from the room out through the chimney. But if the chimney's blocked, the air won't flow, so the coal won't burn. When they blocked this chimney up, um, they've capped it with stone so that we can still use the fireplace in the bedroom above. At the moment, that stone is lingering precariously up that chimney, so they're trying to force it down so it doesn't fall on us while we're working. Upstairs in the bedroom, Paul's attempting to shift the offending stone. It's coming. More, more of that, please. More of that. That's good. Look at the thrash. Hello? 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 Okay. Once the rubble's cleared, the chimney's revealed in all its glory. You can see the shape tapering as it goes up to draw the smoke up. We've had a shoe come out of here and um, a salt hole here. I mean, these houses would have been damp, and this is one of the few places you could keep your salt dry, so it would still be granulated. We're going to sweep the chimney with these drainage rods. Well, as you can see, this is just the beginning. I think there's going to be tons and tons of debris coming down. Got all the bird's nests out of there, and you can see daylight. Just waiting for the range now. In the fields, Alex's early optimisms turned to gloom. And um, what we're finding up this end of the field is that we've got a lot of boulders here and a lot of stones and what's happening is the share is hitting these stones and it's kicking the plough out. If it's a bit wetter, you see, it could just roll it over. The ground is just quite, you know, quite dry. Right. Um, we have had rain overnight, but I don't know if it's gone in. But it's been dry for yes, two months almost. Yes. That's going to create real problems here, is yeah, it? Yeah, it'll, the, the furrow won't want to roll off smoothly. It, it'll want to break in lumps. That might be our worst concern, but we'll have to give it a try. I'm slowly losing confidence here, Jim. Uh, no, no, there's all no the many, to... All the many problems you're pointing out. One. Alex is coming to terms with the challenges that faced the Victorian farmer. Failure of a wheat crop back in the Victorian period would spell disaster for any farmer. I mean, it really would be a case of, of going from sort of struggling to get by to being, to being broke, essentially. Uh, and you might even find yourself and your family in the workhouse. I've got to have a go myself, because obviously a farmer of my stature would know how to plough back in the late 19th century, so I'm a bit anxious oh. here, because if I cock this up, Beard. then Beard. Jim's got a lot of work to do to rectify it. All I want you to do is keep the furrow wheel up against this edge here. Walk on. Good boy. Right. Um, keep the land wheel on the ground. Yep. You can put a little bit of pressure on the right hand handle and that helps turn the furrow better. Right. As long as this wheel doesn't come off the ground, unless you'll lose your depth. How's it doing, Jim? You're right. doing fine, yeah. What Great. do you say? No, no, you're doing I'll soon tell you if you're not. I don't look at my handiwork. It's fine. We'll catch it on the way round. Yeah. It's just mesmerising watching <laughs> it turn over. No. Steady now. Good luck. Good boy. Victorian farmers ploughed an acre a day, walking 11 miles from dawn till dusk. But the work is back-breaking. After a couple of hours, Alex is exhausted. Go on, you're doing well. A little bit more. Thank you. 
and the dry stony ground is adding to his woes. Oh, no, whoa, whoa. totally ridden out there. Oh, it's it's just come a storm. Out. Press on to the right. On to the right. This is doing my back, this really is. Oh. My father used to say that um, hard work never killed anyone, but it made them into gay queer shapes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I suppose a lifetime of ploughing yeah. like that, you know, and, and out in all weathers as well, you know. At the cottage, the chimney's clear, and two flues have been built, ready for the range to be fitted. Peter Parker and Steve Powell are Victorian range experts and have restored a hundred-year-old model. We're just sizing up the oven to make sure that it actually fits within the, the opening that's been made for us. But there's a snag. The flues have already been put in um, and they're, they're too far forward, which means that the oven is protruding in front of the brickwork, which is going to make it a bit of a problem. While adjustments are made to the flues, Peter and Ruth set out to forage for fruit on the Acton Scott estate. This is real hunter-gatherer stuff, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, is, this has been a staple of peoples throughout the ages, for thousands of years. It's probably why it makes you feel so good, isn't it? I mean, I yeah. always feel happy when I'm doing something like this. It always lifts my spirit. So if you think of the toil that's put into the fields, yeah, it also gets crops just to like grow. A, Bonus, yeah. like a blessing, isn't it? Isn't it's your sort luxury of... in life. Yeah. What are, you, what, what are your plans for the slows? Mostly gin. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear. Ooh, I think we've got damsons here. This bounty of free fruit will only last days unless it's preserved. A job that requires a kitchen and a range. After a few alterations to the flues, the range is fitted and ready to be blacked. We're putting graphite onto the cast iron to help protect it from rusting and it gives us a nice sheen. And usually the housewives would do this, the, the young ladies of the house. I'm saying that because we, we don't want to get pressurised into doing this sort of thing at home, do we, Steve? Yeah, true. Ruth's keen to try out the range as soon as possible. But first, she needs some fuel. Ruth and Peter head to the nearby Shropshire Union Canal to collect a cartload of coal. Building Britain's canals was one of the biggest engineering projects the country has ever seen. By the 1850s, over 4,000 miles of waterways had been dug transporting 30 million tonnes of freight a year. This Shropshire narrowboat, Saturn, was restored by Tony Lurie and a group of enthusiasts and is the last of its kind. Hello. Wow, what a boat. Beautiful boat. It's the best, just the best. <laughs> we've, we've got to pick up some coal from you. I'm just going to Very take good, the... yeah. What sort is it? The boat is a Shropshire Union boat, built as a, built as a flyboat. Flyboat. Flyboat, fly boat, non-stop boat, meaning going day and night with changing right. the horses along the way. These boats were the creme de la creme, really. So they were built smaller, they were built slimmer, and they went very well indeed. So it's a very graceful boat. Do you want a hand with the coal? I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> How many times do you want? Uh, well, we've just had a range fitted in our cottage. Well, you're going to need most of this for the winter then, aren't you? <laughs> We're going to need yeah. a fair bit, yeah. yeah. I mean, this stuff changed the entire world, didn't it? It did, and the canals Absolutely helped it, everything. really, because yeah. until the canals came along, um, travelling coal, you know, in bulk for long distances was impossibly expensive. Yeah. As soon as the canals came, suddenly you could deliver 20 tonnes at a time with relative ease, and, and they just, everything burgeoned then, industry, yeah, steam engines. Yeah, absolutely everything. You know, we used to sort of the idea of coal changing industry, but it changes farming, it changes food, it changes laundry, it changes the way you uh, breathe in your house, it changes <laughs> everything. But also just, canals were one of the principal communication networks of Britain yeah. and the Industrial Revolution. But it also enabled farmers 
to move produce across Britain. Yeah. They essentially linked farms, so it allowed them to specialise. Yeah. So they can now yeah, work. Yeah, that's a really good point, isn't it? Being able to choose, you know, yeah. which is most commercially viable. Is it better to be growing grain or is it better to be growing dairy? And whether you've got a canal or a, a railway in your area is going to mm -hmm. be one of the factors mm -hmm. that oh, sure. suddenly makes yeah. you make that decision, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Well, it's the industrialisation of farming in a sense. It is. So that... Transportation opened up wider markets for farmers, enabling them to specialise in one product like dairy, crops or meat. For the first time, it created a national food economy. <laughs> it's late September. The ploughing has taken Alex twice as long as he hoped, but finally the job's done. Next, he must decide what crop to sow. In the cottage, Peter's stripped the walls back to bare stone. Now he must learn how to plaster. And Ruth's about to light the range for the first time, under the guidance of range fitters Peter and Steve. Right. Exciting! Good, I'm glad you are. Oh, you're going to show me what We've you've been up to. We've had it all covered up for you to give you a surprise. OK. And let's hope you like it. <gasps> Oh, wow. What do you think about that? I swear gonna... it comes straight from the factory, wouldn't you? Wow. So let's hope okay. it's going to work as well. Oh, dear, I find and this quite... you're going quite... to do some nice cooking on it. Oh, dear. Mm. I've never used anything like this. You look one it's excited scary. lady. I love it. I know, I, I am. It. I love to see it. I just, I'm terrified it's all going to go horribly mm. wrong and I'm going to be an idiot. <laughs> no, I don't think you will be. Well, we'll see. Ruth's collected kindling in wood to get the coal going. Now I'm getting excited now. I'm a little bit worried as to whether it will work first time. Here we go. Here we go, see if we... Well, those flues are obviously working. They are, aren't they? Oh, yes, that's a bit more like it. You're happy with that? Oh. Mm. <laughs> that looks good, doesn't it? I am a pyromaniac. Mm. Mmm, this fire's lovely and hot now, and the kettle's nearly boiling. Cooking on coal is, is, is so different. Um, it's not something that I've done before, and I know that it has the most enormous impact on what you can cook. Wood smoke tastes nice. Coal smoke, however, tastes foul. Um, it's sort of acidy and sulphurous. In the old way of cooking on wood, you would be almost encouraging smoke to come round your open food, but on coal, you really want to stop that. You want no smoke whatsoever, and you're trying to make sure that you've got as much separation between food and fuel. Coal revolutionised cooking, and recipe books were rewritten for the new fuel. Roasting on a spit went out, and oven roasting came in. I don't know that I'm going to get it right for quite a while. I think it's going to take me half the year to practice. Maybe by the end of the year, I'll be quite good. Coal also revolutionised farming, and nothing symbolises the agricultural revolution more than this, the threshing machine. In the Victorian age, these steam-powered machines moved from farm to farm, threshing wheat, removing the valuable grain from the plant. I'm just looking at our Bible, the Book of the Farm, and once again, Henry Stevens is uh, quick to inform us about what we should be doing here. As the incoming tenants, there'd be certain jobs that we'd have to do, and one of these is to get involved with the threshing. It says here, um, not unfrequently, the incoming tenant undertakes for the outgoing, the threshing and delivering of the crop to market on payment for the trouble. So hopefully we'll be able to earn ourselves a few quid today. Alex and Peter have joined a local threshing team. Tom Henderson operates the steam traction engine. It should start to build up steam in about three quarters of an hour. We should see the gauge move. When we get up over 100 pounds, and we've got enough to start threshing. This new mechanised threshing ended centuries of rural tradition. Until the 1830s, the job of separating the grain from the stalks by hand employed thousands of unskilled men throughout the winter. I've got here a uh, head of wheat, and uh, it's only really with some force that I can release the wheat from the husk. And when you think about this job, timeless, essentially, since the 
first harvests of wheat to separate the grain from the rest of the plant. These machines reduced threshing time from months to just days. Now a few men could do the work of thousands. The unemployed were furious. Farms were attacked and machines smashed. But by the 1880s, the threshing machine was a generally accepted part of country life. The threshing machine is an absolute beast uh, that needs feeding. So I'm just, I'm just pitchforking up these sheaves and they're being put inside. It's reasonably light work, I suppose. I'm just getting to grips with this pitchfork. I've been told I look quite amateurish when I do it. For those lucky enough to get work threshing, there were other advantages. Well, we're cooking eggs and bacon, and uh, I've just got the fat hot on the shovel. Next job now is to put some bacon on. Excuse my clean hand, but it does add to the flavor. There we go, that's rasher number two. We usually get three on. Uh, this, is, this is ideal. Could be non-stick then. Non-stick Teflon shovel, there we are. There you go then, that's how you cook egg and bacon. Lunch break over, it's time to finish the threshing. Basically at the end of the rick now. It's quite precarious because I'm just standing on metal struts with my hobnail boots on. It's a bit slippy. I feel my legs buckling. With the threshing done, the grain is weighed. What's the news then, Mike? Have uh, we done well? Very well, yes. About two and a half hundred weight for the day's thrashing, right. which is about 125 kilograms. Right, okay. Um, so very successful. Most of the grain would have been sold to make flour. Some would have been kept yeah. to re-sow back in the ground for next year's crop. Do the honours? Yeah. You all right with that? Yeah. You sure? Yes. <laughs> Victorian varieties of wheat are very different to modern breeds. Today, we've bred the species so that much of the goodness that goes into the straw actually goes into the head. And, and wheat today actually is very, very short, you know, a couple of foot off the ground. This would grow to about four or five foot off the ground. So hopefully, when we come out here in August, we'll have a crop that we can just barely see over. Before the wheat is sown, the clods of ploughed earth must be broken up by harrowing. This is the first time I've actually ever driven horses myself, so it's absolutely thrilling. This is great fun. Now I'm going to bring them round. This is the difficult bit. Good boys. You know, really, that, I mean, you know, they, they're doing the stuff. At the cottage, Peter's ready to start plastering. He's read in a Victorian manual that the old lime plaster removed from the walls can be recycled. I'm just using this to pulverise the plaster into dust, and I've done about a day of this. It's quite a, quite a laborious process. I mean, it's, it's quite hard on the upper body, but at night it's the, it's the wrists, I think it's the jarring motion. It's great to be reusing materials like this, but it's also very labour intensive. Sand and water are added to make fresh lime plaster. This is actually incredibly tough. I don't know, the consistency we're looking for is quite sloppy. Um, again, it's, it's the ad old adage, a bit like porridge. Pretty much all the materials we use on this farm are a bit like porridge. There's one other essential ingredient, horse hair. And I'm just going to put this in, and this should help the plaster bond when it's on the wall, stop it falling off, hopefully. Oh, it's, it's really good to experiment all these, these old techniques, but um, 
God, they're difficult. <laughs> and they do take time. In the field, Alex must decide how densely to sow the wheat. Too dense and the shoots will compete with each other and die. This bag up at that end. Too sparse and the birds will eat it all. Alex is taking guidance from a highly scientific source, an age-old poem. It goes, one for the rook, one for the crow, one to let rot, one to let grow. So according to that um, little poem there, we should be anticipating losing some three quarters of what we're sowing today. Alex has called in local farmer Brian Davis and his daughter Sharon to help. To sow the wheat, they're using a seed drill. It's a real concern because, really, you wouldn't normally do this job in the rain and we're hoping this is just a shower and it's just going to pass, but it's looking fairly ominous. Traditionally, seed was sown by hand, broadcast. The problem with broadcast sowing is that the grain lands on the ground and it, and it hits the ground at different heights and then when you harrow it over, you'll get the seed, because it's at different heights within the seed bed, it'll grow at different times, it'll be uneven, it'll mature at different periods. The seed drill, invented in 1701 by Jethro Tull, was a major leap forward in the industrialisation of farming. This was the moment when farming became scientific. Brian has brought along a design from the 1880s, the pinnacle of Victorian technology. The wheat in the hopper at the top, it drops down the bottom into a little trough. And the revolving cups there that you can see, those discs with the cups on, you can just see them picking the wheat up and dropping them into the little yellow containers, which then funnel them down into these tubes so that they drop out in the drill. So the seeds are all planted at the optimum depth, increasing the chances of germination. But with just two rows sown, Alex's worst fears about the weather are realised. Unfortunately, it's just not working out for us today. The problem is, is it's just so wet, it's so damp, the silt gets so heavy that it's just a nightmare for the horses to pull. It's a bit of a nightmare, really, because it looks like we're not going to get it done today, and if this weather's set in for a couple more days, um, you know, we're going to really struggle to get the grain in the ground. Do you want to park it up under the trees, then? At the cottage, Peter and stonemason Paul are preparing to plaster the kitchen. So we've each got a churn brush, and, um, yeah, we're just going to brush it down. It's yet another dusty job on the farm. And after that, we're going to get our stirrup pump and we're going to moisten it, which will help the, uh, the plaster adhere to the wall. This is our stirrup pump that we um, found in the tool shed. It's pretty old. Paul and I have taken it apart and we've tried to fix the seals because originally more water would come up in your face and it would actually come out of the nozzle. But um, I'm surprisingly dry and it's working very well, so I think we've succeeded. It's a remarkable improvement and the air quality in here. It's time to apply Peter's recycled plaster. And what you have to do is work it into the wall. Nice layer on, because once it's on the wall, we can spread it out. Really makes your forearms ache, doesn't it? Well, it I'm does. Wondering. Doing very well. <laughs> You're a good liar, Paul. <laughs> I'm learning an awful lot. I'm also learning that the process has actually taken an awful lot of time. You can't hurry lime plaster. And we've got a number of coats to put on here. And Ruth's just got a range and she's quite keen to have a meal. So I don't think we're going to be finished in time. It's mid-October. After a week of rain, the sun has returned, so Alex is back out with a seed drill, planting the rest of the crop. So, so far, so good. Um, you know, this is really turning out brilliantly. Uh, two days ago, it was absolutely bucketing down, and now it's, uh, you know, it's really dried off, really crumbly surface. 
we've got good distribution. It took us a couple of rows to get to get it right, but um, it's, so far it's, it's looking really, really good. It's the last thing that we need to do in here, really. I don't think we'll have to come in in spring and do any hoeing, and it's the job done, and it's a relief, really, um, because. You know, it's the first thing to do in the agricultural year, and it's one of the most important things. You know, hopefully now we're going to get a good year. We just really have to leave it to the weather, and uh, we'll be back here in August to um, to harvest the crop, and only then will we know just how successful things have gone. In the cottage, the sunny weathers helped the slow-drying Victorian plaster to dry. After removing half a century of grime, replastering and repainting, it's returned to its Victorian glory, complete with a Victorian brass bed lent by the Actons. I'm afraid it's still rather a building site. Mm, so I can see. Yeah. The cottage will mainly be Ruth's domain, so she's taking advice. <laughs> Dr Nicola Verdon is an expert on the role of the Victorian farmer's wife. If you read the farming manuals, which were written by men, so mm. for example, Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm, which was a very popular 19th century manual and went through mm. several editions, and they don't mention the cleaning of the farmhouse as a task. They talk about the dairy and the poultry and the food processing and so on, yeah. but the cleaning and the laundry work and so on, which were big tasks and would have taken up a large amount of time. These aren't mentioned. Just manuals. magically happen, do they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola helps Ruth tackle a much feared Victorian pest, the bed bug, using turpentine and salt. I always used to think the bed bugs were like, you know, like dust mat mite sort of things that lived in, in mattresses, but they're not. They're, they're, they're nasty. They get everywhere. They get everywhere. They live in any little tiny crack or space and lie dormant for months on end. And then as soon as carbon dioxide, so your breath, right. you know, as soon as you're in the room and you're breathing, yeah. that reactivates them and then they come out and get you and suck <laughs> pints of blood over a, over a couple of months, um, which sounds really unpleasant. Tackling bed bugs was a twice yearly job. Others were daily. And this obviously would have been one of her first tasks of the day, would be cleaning the bedrooms, making the beds and so on. Um, alongside the milking of the cow, the feeding uh, the pigs, the feeding the pigs and the hens and any other small animals that are in the farmyard, yeah. um, and making the breakfast, obviously, and making sure the men are all fed Sorted and watered, out. emptying the chamber pots. Absolutely, working all day, basically, yeah. uh, very, very little leisure time indeed. It's late October. In a few days, the animals arrive, and caring for them will be a full-time job. By now, Peter hoped to have completed the cottage, but there's still an awful lot to be done. Ruth can't wait to use the range, so she's braving the building site with Nicola to preserve the foraged fruit. What we're doing now in the kitchen was actually one of the main roles yeah, of a farmer's well. wife. Yes, that preservation of foodstuffs the food processing, the preserving of seasonal food. And this really kept the, uh, the farm and the family and the workforce ticking over. So it was very important that a farmer married a woman who was a good cook. And look how much fruit we gathered. I mean, we just got loads and loads and loads of it. They're using forage damsons and crab apples to make an Indian version of pickle, chutney. We shouldn't be surprised, really, that so much Indian food comes into English cookery. After all, there we were, over there. High to the empire. High to the empire. The century. First, the fruit is slowly cooked. Then a mixture of ginger, turmeric, cayenne pepper and cloves are added. So where are we getting these recipes from? Well, these particular ones are from Eliza Acton's right. recipe book, um, but you can find similar ones in almost every recipe book of the period. And these Everything were cheap enough Indian. for... Most farmers' wives to have been able to afford yeah. at least one or two. They seem to have been deeply common, and you could buy them pre-prepared. Peter and Alex also make the most of the autumn crop of fruit, 
under the watchful eye of the estate's owner, Thomas Stackhouse Acton. Every year he makes cider using apples from the orchards. There's quite a few on the ground. These are cider apples, aren't they, these ones? Yes, these will these will do. All of these ones, yes? And yes. Does, it doesn't matter about these blemishes? No, it doesn't matter about those. Okay. Uh, no ones which have gone black. Right. Well, like, like that one, I suppose. That one we don't want. No. no. <laughs> right, no, I think that, that one looks a bit past it, even to the untrained eye, Peter. <laughs> oh, and avoid God. putting leaves in. Right, okay. With the windfall apples collected, Mr. Acton springs into action. This is a panking pole, and we use it to shake the apples off. Find your head. One on the back. <laughs> I'm quite blessed. See why you're wearing a hard hat now. Yes. Standard gear, mate. The chutney's been simmering for three hours, so the stewed damsons and crab apples are infused with the spices. Like all chutneys, this improves with keeping. I mean, you can eat it straight away, but it tastes much better after about three months. Um, you, you sort of lose that vinegary edge, don't mm. you, in it? So this will be really tasty right in the heart of winter. Yeah! I'm sorting out the ceiling of the jars, which we're going to do with the bladders of pigs. <laughs> These are particularly good because they're so stretchy and watertight. I should get several, several lids out of each one. I don't think I've ever actually <laughs> stretched a pig's bladder before. First time for everything. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. So if I stretch that over, certainly as it dries, it will shrink and then we'll get a really tight seal on it. It's not as bad to touch, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's more slimy. It's a little bit, yeah, but it's only like wet rubber would be. Ruth and Nicola are making another Indian-inspired recipe, pick a lily. So this is the, the vinegar the, and the spices. Ruth stocks the larder with the preserves and pickles ready for winter. As well as chutneys, she's also made tomato ketchup another popular Victorian relish. I'm going to let the piccalilli, which was in this one here, cool down before I put the lids on them. Actually, I'm really relieved to have finally managed to be able to get some of this pickling and preserving done. Without the range, though, I just couldn't do anything. And I've been watching all the fruits in the hedgerows, you know, beginning to go over. I'm thinking, ah, you know, I've got to move soon or we'll have nothing in here. So it is a relief. Right, let's have these apples on the pier. <clears throat> OK. Over it goes. The fruit gathered from the orchard will be crushed using a Victorian cider mill. Just that bag, and that'll go. be enough, I think. You think this right? OK. That's enough to be starting with. OK. Now it's a case of getting the horse to do all the hard work. How long have you been doing this for then? Uh, we've been doing this for about 25 years, I suppose. Right. Have you ever had a good, really good vintage year? Well, we haven't made a note of it. <laughs> we just keep drinking it steadily. <laughs> <laughs> what consistency are we looking for here then? Um, consistency of porridge. Right. <clears throat> The boys are being helped by local farmer Merle Wilson. Yeah. Peter's taken Mr Acton's usual job, steadying the millstone, but things aren't running smoothly. Yeah. Oh. Well, you've got to, you're getting a bit of a build-up in here. Yeah. Every time this stone does one rotation, yeah. uh, it settles. Right. Now, if it's got good momentum and there's not too many apples, it'll just carry on. Mr Acton, you were saying that this stone, you think it might have been used for sharpening? Uh, probably. That's why it's got a, a, a flat on it. It's got a slightly flat edge. Yes. You wouldn't think a stone wheel could have a flat, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mm. think that's what, I think that's what's creating most of the problems. He seems to be making a harder job of it than you, Mr Acton. <laughs> <laughs> well, he hasn't had so many years at it. <laughs> no, he's a lot to learn. Okay. 
In the cottage, Ruth's ready to cook her first meal on the range. I've got a leg of mutton here. You can see by the size of it. It is not a leg of lamb, it is indeed a leg of mutton. It makes so much more economic sense to eat adult sheep after you've had eight years of cropping them for their wool. And mutton was ever such a popular, traditional and common dish for the middle classes. In fact, sometimes they actually call mutton eaters as a sort of definition of people who were doing OK, but not great. So I'm going to take the bone out and boil it like that. Mm. Yeah, I think that's done it. Yes! Ha-ha! <laughs> right. I'll roll that up. Oh, that doesn't look too bad. Tie it up neat. I'm just going to pop him in. The pulverised apples are ready to be squeezed for juice using a cider press. Winding things up again, are we, Peter? Not as much as you, Alex. Here's your first load of apples. I don't know about you, Mo, but my hands are utterly freezing yes, sir, in these apples. Thank you very much. The pulp is loaded onto mats known as hairs. This cider that we hopefully make um, is going to be kept, it's going to be used for our hay harvest uh, as a means of um, giving to our workers, our labourers. And quite often, the, the quality of your cider would be something that would attract labourers to your farm to do the work. And the farm would also keep back a batch for himself, and he'd probably have some rotten stuff for people he didn't like. Like Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, it's going to end up on your head. <laughs> the stack of hairs, known as a cheese, is put under immense pressure to squeeze every last drop of apple juice from them. And we're just bringing the, the beam down to press it. Great stuff. Just compressing the cheese, and we're getting all the juice out, all the apple juice. It's such a lovely colour as well, isn't it? Keep it going. It's getting really hard now. Juice coming out. You pleased? Very pleased. We've pressed this as much as we can now. Um, it won't go any further. The juice is stored in casks, where it'll be left for the next few months to ferment. It should start fermenting in five days. You have to top it up regularly, sort of every day, um, otherwise the air gets in and you get impurities in. So we need to top it up with pond water or stream water, basically water that hasn't come in contact with metals. The last job of autumn's done. Just in time to greet the arrival of the first animals. Ten Shropshire ewes. Bred in the 1840s from local wild sheep, they're famed for their excellent meat and wool. But the boy's shepherding skills are put to the test almost immediately. One of our newly arrived ewes split from the flock and has come into this garden. Any, any sign of her? Yes and no. Yes and no. I could have sworn I saw her in here. Let's... She's up there. Alex? Yep. Found her. You get behind her. Easier said than done. It's pretty thick up here. Oh, no. What a nightmare. There's a gate. Has she gone through? This doesn't bode well for the year. Oh, no. Ah, oh, I, I think all those sheep over there have seen her. Yeah. She's, she's in the field. The runaway sheep has joined a nearby farm's flock. Yeah, these fences are pretty low. Well, a 90% success rate there. Richard Spencer, a sheep farmer of 40 years' experience, has come to give some much-needed advice to the novice shepherds. The one thing you have to remember, you guys, when you're sort of getting settled down with this flock of sheep, every shepherd knows a sheep is the only animal in God's creation looking for the quickest way to die. You can do everything right, <laughs> ah, yeah. You can do everything right, you can all go pear-shaped, you can make loads of mistakes. If Mother Nature's with you, you'll come out smelling of roses. It's just, right. that's the way Mother Nature and life start. You've just got to accept it. If the ewes are to produce young, they must be in tip-top health. Richard's checking out the field where they're to live. Well, young man, it's a good thick turf. 
it'll carry the sheep come winter this will yes it'll you take some weather you need a good turf to carry livestock in winter Ooh. right if it gets wet and you haven't got a solid turf there's nothing to carry the weight of the sheep but this will be right. fine this will be fine this will and i've read about flushing which is where you put them into good pasture and then they're because of their improving condition they're more likely to conceive twins essentially is there any basis of fact Oh, absolutely, it's fact, fact all the way, because very basically, if the sheep is bursting with energy, she's had all this lovely lush grass, she's going to shed more eggs, she's going to have more lambs. Okay, so we're doing a good thing here, absolutely. Yeah. bringing them into this type of grass. Yes. In a few days' time, once the ewes have settled into life on the fresh pasture, it'll be time to introduce a ram. Hopefully, come spring, they'll produce plenty of young. It's time to move into the cottage. It's very kind of the actors to lend us these chairs. Yeah, well, whatever you do, don't break them. Try not to. <laughs> and Ruth's first meal, cooked on the range, is ready. This smells absolutely delicious. What are we okay. having? Um, boiled mutton. You couldn't grab a plate, could yes. you? Yes, yep. Um, <sighs> right in here, shall I? Ooh. <laughs> oh! There we go. Oh. Are you okay, fella? Could you help me? Are <laughs> you really that stuck? <laughs> My arse. Went straight through. Oh, no. oh, no. Look, you'll have to use the clun chair. <laughs> which isn't much better, actually. How do you think it's gone, then, so far? Uh, uh, it's more work than I thought it was going to be, getting yeah. this all ready, quite yeah. obviously. Yeah, the building work on top of everything else. Yeah, but well, that's like modern builders, you know. They always come in, yeah, it'll take a couple of weeks. Yeah. You know, <laughs> six weeks later, you're still waiting. So, you know. It's, it's starting to look good. Yeah. It's starting to come alive. Yeah, the good news is, is that we are ready for our animals, mm. just. Peter, Ruth and Alex sleep elsewhere on the estate. But with the bedroom finished, Ruth can't resist spending the night here. I've got my chamber pot if I need it in the night and I've heated a brick on the range and wrapped it in a cloth and I'm hoping that this will warm the bed up a bit, act like a hot water bottle. And then I'm going to get in on my lovely feather mattress that I've cleaned and stuffed earlier. Get Ooh, that feels rather nice actually. Actually be any bed bugs. <laughs> Here in Shropshire is a farm that's frozen in time, lost in Victorian rural England. A unique project has brought it back to life, as it would have been in the 1880s. This is the way to travel, isn't it? Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn are living the lives of Victorian farmers for a full calendar year. Oh, no. From the cold of winter to the warmth of summer, turning the clock back to rediscover an age gone by. They are an unruly bunch. They really are. That's the first lamb you've actually delivered, is it, Alex? That is the first lamb I've ever delivered. They've been here for two months. Doing my back, this really is. Oh. They've sown a wheat crop using only horsepower, a back breaking job almost thwarted by the weather. Unfortunately, it's just not working out for us today. The problem is, is it's just so wet. Restored their farm cottage, complete with a coal fired cooking range. I've never used anything like this. You're one excited lady, I love it. I know, I, I am. It. And lost their new flock of Victorian sheep. What a nightmare. This doesn't bode well for the year. Oh, no. Now it's winter, and if the livestock is to survive, the team must winterproof the Victorian farm. It's November, and the farmers work to protect the livestock from the freezing winter temperatures. So Peter needs to build a pair of pigsties, the biggest challenge so far. We've had snow, we've had rain, and it's just so cold. 
Ruth will have some demanding household chores. And it's flipping hard work. And Alex must get to grips with their shire horse, the tractor of the Victorian farm. How am I doing then? You're doing very well. A Victorian farmer uses every available hour of sunlight, seven days a week. But if they want to enjoy a traditional Victorian Christmas, they'll need to get everything done on time. <laughs> the ewes have settled into life on the Victorian farm. But to rear lambs, they'll need a ram. Richard Spencer has spent his life breeding Shropshire sheep, and he's providing the services of his prize ram, Frederick. Frederick is a 20-month-old ram that's called a shearling. And I'm rather pleased with him. I'm taking him up to the ewes now. He's not quite sure where he's going, so he's not very happy, but as soon as he smells the ewes, he'll be going like a bullet from a gun. I think he's seen them. Come on. If I get it wrong, it's trouble. There, boy, he's seen them. He's seen them. He's seen them. Come on, boy, look at that. He's been waiting 20 months for this moment. Look at the arrogance, look at the pride. Head up in the air, I am. And look at the back end, that's what a Shropshire is all about. Wool, yes, fine, but meat. Back end, wide, plenty of width, plenty of meat on that leg of lamb for the Sunday roast. Definitely a lovely ram, that. Poise, balance, power, everything, everything where you want it, yeah. Like that, good. Sue Farquhar is president of the Shropshire Sheep Breeders Association and has come to give the boys some advice on shepherding. When should we expect lambing time? Lambing time, if you put your ram in on Guy Fawkes Day, which is today, you would expect to have your first lambs on All Fools Day. April the 1st. Right, OK. One of the joys of spring. That's yes. it. You've got to learn to be good shepherds and watch and look, you know, and you'll get to know how your sheep behave when they're happy, when they're not happy. Get to know the characters. Yes. And hopefully, Frederick will fit in well. Ooh. This is Peter's shirt. I don't know what he does to his clothes, but every time they come off like this, look at it. Ah! Ruth, an expert on domestic history, is tackling the laundry, a mammoth four-day routine. Victorian laundry is about only using the chemicals that you have to use, um, rather than just like throwing loads in the wash and using them willy-nilly. Instead, just use the little bit on the bit you need. The first stage of the process is to deal with stains. Oh, yes. I've got ink stains. Look at that. On my cuffs there. Some of the things that were being used in the Victorian period to get rid of stains were really, really ancient recipes. You can find reference to them hundreds of years back. Um, things like, um, well, the ink, for example. That's going to go in some milk. It just softens it all up and then they come out in the ordinary wash. As I do it, that milk's changing into a sort of a grey colour as it's taking the ink straight out. After half an hour of sat in there, I'll just be able to throw it in the wash with everything else and it should come out. Fruit stains, however, a bit more of a pain. Fruit acids are particularly difficult, and many Victorian recipes recommend that you first of all use butter on them and then sit the whole thing in a mix of ammonia and washing soda. I've got some glue on here, I'm not quite sure how. So this one I'm going to get off with alcohol. This one is whiskey, <laughs> brandy, any of the spirits will work. Laundresses always did have a reputation with being drunkards. <laughs> Maybe it's using the spirits a little too freely. There we go. This is dry cleaning, really, isn't it? Dissolves straight away. Soap, after all, is just a different sort of solvent. It just dissolves grease. Um, whereas alcohol will dissolve a range of other things. That's just peeling right off now. Excellent. That's what I wanted to see. The chemicals have only gone where there is a problem. Use less, costs you less, pollutes less. <laughs> 
Among the most important animals for a small Victorian farm are pigs. They'll eat almost anything and are the fastest growing of all domestic animals. But there's nowhere suitable to keep them on the farm they've inherited. So the team must build pig styes. A project like this on a Victorian farm, I imagine it would be all hands to the pump. Unfortunately, it's only uh, myself and Alex to a certain extent, so we've drafted in Tom here to give us a hand. Alex's brother, you might have noticed by the, re the striking resemblance. With the foundations complete, the next job is laying the floor. Pigs must be kept warm over winter, so the team are insulating it and? using a Victorian technique. Are you happy? Yeah, I'll put a bit more down there. I think Tom's got a load of bottles to bring in. Oh, oh well, maybe one less now. <laughs> this layer of wine bottles are going to uh, create an air gap underneath the floor, and that will act as a form of insulation. A bit like in your house, where you'll have um, two walls with a gap of air in between. It will just stop the cold coming up from the ground, because pigs, they like their creature comforts. It's a bit like humans, really. I mean, humans are called long pigs. Obviously, we can't use Victorian bottles because, you know, there just aren't that many of them around and they do cost a little bit in antique shops. So we're just using wine bottles. The best way of recycling is reuse, and this is reuse. And uh, the crew have happily been drinking <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of bottles of wine. <laughs> they didn't need asking twice. <laughs> Peter covers the recycled bottles with a state-of-the-art Victorian material. Concrete. Pigs are very intelligent animals. They're also scavengers, and they're used to digging up things in the forest on the floors. If you've got stone, they'll quite often dig up the stones, whereas concrete is a lot harder to get up. Have you done this before? No. No, I haven't. <laughs> I've got, all, I've got all my fingers. Right, don't take your fingers off. Well, I can see this being a back-breaking job. Of course, a farmyard of animals will need feeding. During the harsh winter months, this is a real challenge for the Victorian farmer. According to Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm, mangle wurzels are an excellent winter feed. These root vegetables are rich in nutrients and should last the winter without rotting. He writes about you can use both parts of the plant here. Now, you can use the roots to feed the cows and the sheep. Yeah. The green on top, though, the leaves, you yeah. can use to feed geo animals, but he says it's actually better as a green manure. Frost destroys mangle wurzels, so Alex will need to find a way of storing them over the winter. the second week of November, and winter has arrived early on the Acton Scott estate. It snowed pretty heavily in the night, and it's settled, so the pigsties are off for today. Alex has gone out to um, feed the animals, make sure they're okay, but as for the rest of us, it's kind of a day indoors, really. Didn't think we'd get snow this early in the year, and it's, it's really gonna set it back if we're having to you know, take days out like this. Ruth keeps warm in the laundry, where the clothes have been soaking overnight. All the advice manuals say that you need to get up extra early on wash day. So if you're normally getting up about sort of six, it's at least two hours before that. Um, I remember reading one of them that actually suggested that the laundry maid should get up at two in the morning on wash day. Two in the morning. Can you imagine? Most of the things I use stain removers from are from in this lot. The chemicals will have softened it all off, but they won't have actually removed it yet until I start doing the bashing. This is dollying. If you can see, it's a washing machine. This is what a washing machine is mimicking. Just swishing about so that it dislodges the dirt, which hopefully has all been softened by the soaking we did before. And it's flipping hard work. On a small farm like this, we're doing the laundry probably once a week. Um, the idea being that you should start on Monday 
and have it all finished and dry and ironed and put away by the weekend and then start all over again. I have to keep this up basically until the clothes are clean, until I've driven all the dirt out. If you think how long your washing machine is on its washing cycle, that will give you some idea of quite how long this is going to take me. After an hour of back-breaking work, the wash cycle is over. And the clothes are ready to be wrung out. It might not look like it, but this is the most amazing labour-saving device. This is a real product of the Industrial Revolution, this machine. Mass production. Little domestic ones are new to the Victorian period. And as the cast iron manufacturers produce more and more of them, the price comes down and down and down. And more and more people can afford one. Ruth has now spent two days in the laundry, but she's barely halfway through the process. Alex consults the book of the farm for advice on how to store mangle wurzels over winter. It recommends something called a tump. I'm coming out to our tump or clamp, and this is where we've stored all our root vegetables for our animals to overwinter. And we've just covered them with a layer of thick layer of straw, some of the straw that we threshed. Now the reason we do this is essentially to keep the frost off of them. It doesn't matter if they get wet, but if the frost gets to them, they'll rot down and they will last all winter round. Now that is actually bone dry. The organ grinder's monkey. Ah, the root slicer. Yep, it's, it moves really well. Peter's taking time out from the pigsties to get these Victorian food processors up and running. This root slicer is about to be used for the first time in over 50 years. Mr Acton said it had a good action. Right. OK. However, it is missing one of these feeders. Which might be a problems. problem. Might be. Let's give it a go. See what happens. Shall I, just put, shall I put one small one in to start with? Because, again, this is a machine that we haven't used before. No idea where it comes. Do you want a bucket underneath? Uh, that's a good idea. Good idea. <laughs> that's assuming... <laughs> Assuming that it comes out the bottom. Right. Bucket in position. Up to speed. Ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, mate. You just munched through it. Like <laughs> chips. I was going to say. Perfect chips. All we need is a deep fat fryer. <laughs> Look at that. It's the whole reason we're doing this, breaking it down into smaller parts so that the animal can eat them a lot quicker and also, of course, so that they can digest them that much easier. The more they digest, the fatter they get and that's really better for us as farmers. To supplement these carbohydrates, it's important the animals have roughage provided by chaff, cut up straw. OK, I think that's ready to go. Yeah, it's going. It's pulling itself in. This is a Victorian chaff cutter. The teeth drag the straw through spinning blades to chop it up. And it's going absolutely everywhere, Peter. Mechanised farming it may be, but the power comes from humans. You can see how people would have lost their fingers. <laughs> I mean, it's so exposed, the machinery. You've got two blades whizzing in front of you. You've got two giant rollers with teeth pulling the, the straw through. It's a health and safety nightmare. <laughs> this took a lot shorter than I thought it would. How did it feel moving? Well, it's knackering. <laughs> Back in the late 19th century, machines like this, um, they really are top of the range. Yeah. And, it's, and it's innovation, it's, it's a new type of agriculture, that's the thing. The Industrial Revolution had brought an age of machinery that increased the efficiency of food production. As a result, farmers could now manage more animals and fatten them quicker, which all meant increased profits. I am finally ready for final. Note the way I like the word final. Final, final, final. Final rinse. It's day three in the laundry for Ruth, and another six in the morning start. This is 
A cube of blue. It couldn't be more finest, purest blue, could it? It's synthetic ultramarine. Ultramarine is a stone from Afghanistan. Cost of flipping fortune. But in the mid part of the 19th century, chemists discovered a way of synthesizing it, making it artificially. Um, so this is artificial blue. And it'll dye the whole stuff a slight, slight tinge of blue, um, which will counteract the yellowness of the soap. And to the human eye, it will look white. They do look white, don't they? I see that yellow tinge disappearing. Modern washing powders still contain blue to give a brilliant whiteness. Next is a boil wash to kill any bacteria, followed by yet more mangling. This is when you need a small child, just a little pair of hands. That would be so helpful. Outside, the pigsty walls are slowly taking shape. The beauty of stone walling is that you don't have to build in courses. You can Paul Arrowsmith, a stonemason of 25 years' experience, is teaching Peter the secret of building with stone. But we're building the stone wall in the same, same way you build a dry stone wall, so all the stones touch, so it's stone on stone. The mortar just stops the wind from blowing through, keeps the weather out. But despite Paul's tutelage, Peter is finding it difficult. They have a habit of building like a row of rotten teeth, which is very hard to build off. So they find it hard to get the next course of stone on. Of course, unlike building with brick, no two stones are the same, and Peter is struggling to find suitable shapes to fit his uneven wall. At the moment, fish out of the water, really. 3D jigsaw puzzle, 2D jigsaw eyes on. Oh. So at the moment, I've, I've just got this gap I've got to fill. And I reckon, well, one stone would be nice. But, you know, <laughs> we're not in a perfect world, quite obviously. But I get very tempted to take stones <laughs> that are existing in the wall and move them. Do you want one for there? Yes, please. It's going to make me a stain. Yes. Oh, yes, Master Mason. <laughs> that work? The stones are secured using Victorian lime mortar, and this is presenting its own problems. But this mortar, if it freezes, it's useless. It's like sand. Yes. And our pigs could push it over if they so wish. So hopefully, if we can build in the the peak of the day when it's dry and a bit warmer and then we cover everything up at night, the water will dry. But it is the wrong time of year and people won't believe me if I, if I tell them I'm building pigsties in the winter. By half three, after just seven hours of work, it's time to stop building. It's getting dark already, so um, we're going to prep the walls for the night. We're just laying sheep fleeces over them just to give them a bit of protection from the quite severe frosts that are coming in every night. It's the fourth day of the laundry process. The washing is dry. Time for Ruth to iron the clothes. I have to say, I hate ironing. It's so time-consuming, this. Anybody makes any comments about me not looking anything less than utterly perfect at Christmas, it's going to get hung, drawn and quartered. If the animals give you a sort of shape to the day and mean you have to, you know, have this daily routine in and out, it's the laundry that separates out your week. You know, Saturday night, sorting out all the clothes. Monday morning, the horrendous wash day. Tuesday, drying. Wednesday starching, Thursday ironing. Oh yes, look at that, lovely. Every morning, Peter and Alex rise at dawn to feed the sheep. By now, if Fred the Ram has done his job, all 10 ewes should be pregnant. But at the moment, there's no way of being sure. The book of the farm recommends a technique known as rattling. This involves painting a red mark on the ram's breast. When mating with a ewe, it rubs off, 
leaving a telltale mark on her back. Let's put a bit of this linseed oil in. I think I'm going to have to use some of this pig fat as well. Try and mix that in. Yeah, that's really coming together now. What do you think of this, Peter? How's that? Certainly red enough. To apply the rattle, they need to catch Fred, all 22 stones of him. Myself and Alex have spent a lot of time thinking about this. I mean, it's last time I handled sheep, I broke my finger. And it's an experience I don't really want to repeat, although I think it's quite an occupational hazard. So the plan is get the sheep in the yard, split Fred our ram from them, get him in there, into here, close the gate on him, get him into this corner, and then shut this gate on him. So we crush him between these gates. Not hard, but just enough so he can't move. And then Alex can stick the rattle on him. That is the plan. That's what we're hoping for. He is really strong, this guy. He's an enormous beast. Thank you. <laughs> the ram's quite big as well. Sheep. 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 Where's the ram? The ram's over there, the ram's isn't it? The ram's there. He's right at the back there. Just slowly. Hooray! Well, that was a little bit easier than I anticipated. Now the difficult bit, separating Fred the ram from the ewes. Our idea is just to push them into that end of the yard and then hopefully, hopefully gate them in, but um, it's going to be difficult. Right, we've got him separated now. This might take some time. No, no, no. On the Victorian farm, shepherding is men's work, whereas the poultry are looked after by women. These are our three turkeys. We have Wilfred and Ina and Lillian. Ina's on the menu for Christmas. <laughs> so we're just keeping an eye on Yeah, yeah, you lot as well. We'll eat you too if you like. Turkey in the Victorian period was already taking over from goose as a more traditional bird. It's bigger for a start, so if you've got more people to feed, it's a better choice. And um, the turkey industry was developing over in Norfolk to a degree it hadn't really been before. And with the railways, many people in towns in particular were able to get turkeys much cheaper than they had been. It's always a bit sad to lose your own livestock because you get fond of them, but I mean, that's their purpose, isn't it? Um, and I do find it very comforting to know that they've had a good life. <laughs> Time for a coffee. <laughs> After a couple of failed attempts, the boys have finally managed to shepherd all the sheep into a pen. Now they need to separate Fred from the ewes. If you were to hold here and I were to go in, I could maybe turn one round. Yeah. And you could open, you could stand at the gate here and we'll just let them out one at a time. <laughs> Get the wrong one. <laughs> Fortunately, he's right at the end. I know. God, they're bloody strong. God. Come here, darling. There we go. Off you go. <laughs> they look wedged. <laughs> I don't know which one to start with. <laughs> yeah. Off you go. Right. Got him, I got him. Go strong, strong. Head in there. Woo! He is strong though, he's really strong. We really want to put it in a place so that when he does get on top of her, we can guarantee that he's mounted her very well and obviously that he's done the job. <laughs> Painting the fourth bridge with a toothbrush. It is, yeah. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. Come on. Come on. With Fred raring to go, it's time to let nature take its course. Can you, can you just give us a hand, Fonz? I just want to get this off him. Got his flock back. Is he going to jump on one? 
This weather. With the cold of winter beginning to bite, Peter urgently needs to finish the pigsties. It's another frosty morning on the farm, but early Christmas present from Alex is keeping me really warm along with the fire. And um, the frost really is slowing up our building work because it affects the mortar so badly, but we're starting to get the roof on. So hopefully by the 19th of December, when the pigs come, we'll be putting on our, our last bit of stain and saying, in you go, it's your porcine palace. Enjoy. Thomas Stackhouse Acton, owner of the farm's estate, is a Victorian farming enthusiast. He's insisted that every aspect of the styes be authentic, even down to the nails. Every time Mr Acton has taken down a building uh, on his land, he has saved the nails. Can we get a nice straight one, please, Peter? I'll try. These blacksmith cut nails were giving way to mass produced wire nails by the 1880s. These have gone up relatively fast, although I have to say, the way I've chosen to do it, kneeling on the battens like this, is absolutely killing my knees now. With work on the pigsties over for another day, Peter heads out of the fields to check on the ewes. We're in luck. It looks like um, the rattles worked. I mean, uh, a couple of the sheep have got marks on them, and we'll be able to split them from the rest of the flock, so we'll probably have two stages of lambing. All that trouble to get that onto Fred, and it's worked. It's worked a treat. It's December. All 10 ewes have rattle marks, so come April, they should produce lambs. Despite the harsh weather, the walls of the pigsties are almost complete. But there's still an awful lot to do before the pigs move in. The turkeys, on the other hand, are coming on nicely, ready for Christmas. But the farm's not complete without a working horse, the tractor of the Victorian farm. In the 1800s, over a million shire horses worked on farms across England, but today, they're an endangered breed, and just a few thousand survive. The team's been lent Clumper by Sharon Davis, a local farmer. Good man. Hello, Sharon. Hello. Right, how, are how are you? I'm well, and you? Wonderful, yes, good, I'm, good. I'm doing very well. This is Clumper. It is, yes. But Sharon isn't sure whether he's a purebred shire. Alex calls on John Ward of the Shire Horse Society for his verdict. I'll just have a look over him and see He's got the size. The Shire's geldings are all 17 hands plus high for working. Got the weight. Right. He, he must weigh nearly a ton. It needs a big horse to pull a big weight. So, so right. you know, he, he's, And See, the characteristic of the Shire horse is the, we, the feather. Right. The nice silky hair on the leg we call the feather. The colour, bay, grey and uh, uh, black are the colours. So he, he comes with that criteria. He, he's a, he, this is a bay? He's a good bay, he right. is, yes, yes. So we've got the feathering, the bay, yes, the, the, yes. The, the weight and the height yes, is, is yes, all yes. good. And you've got a very good collar. Many people think a horse pulls a wagon, it doesn't, it pushes into the collar, and then the wagon or whatever it is, is, to, is attached to the aims here. And so it actually pushes, it doesn't pull. So we're looking for a lot of strength in here then, Absolutely. are we? And of course, in there. Right. That's where the real strength comes from. Right. The power in the, in the hindquarters. So all, all, all round, this is a, a pretty good shire. It is. It's a good specimen of the breed oh, well, I'm for pleased. a working horse. That's great, that's great news. Yes. The shire horse was bred in the 1800s as the ultimate workhorse. Leading landowners from the shires, Staffordshire, Derbyshire, Leicestershire, Shropshire, interbred the finest cart horses they could find to create the shire horse. You're looking to breed a sort of sort of super horse, which is is finely tuned for doing all of the kind of heavy draft work around the farm. That's right. All the work on the farm is done with, was done with the shire horse. Right. Whether it's ploughing, harrowing, or drilling, or, or harvesting, it, it was their means of uh, moving anything from A to B. It was the shire horse that you right. did it. 
So this is this is not only is this your sort of tractor, this is also your Land Rover. This is your basically your 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 farm vehicle, is it? Absolutely. With Christmas three weeks away, Ruth begins preparations for the meal. Christmas puddings or plum puddings, a particularly British thing. You don't find them anywhere else in the world, really. Oh, brandy. Can't have too much brandy in a Christmas pud. Christmas pudding is packed with luxurious ingredients, like dried fruit, spices and spirits, which would have been costly to the Victorian farmer. A time of year and a, and a dish which in the Victorian pe period people were willing to sort of save up for. We still eat Victorian Christmas pudding. One of those things we've hung on to as a tradition. One final ingredient to go in this Christmas pudding, and that's money. Traditionally, it's a pair of sing silver sixpences. Oh, that sounded an awful lot to me, so um, I'll put in four pences. Ruth's okay. rich mixture must be boiled without getting wet, and that requires some Victorian ingenuity. I like this bit. I've always thought it was a bit like magic. Take one good, clean cloth. Wet or damp, anyhow. Just spread with flour. <laughs> and the instant I drop it into hot water, a seal is made. A completely watertight seal. In goes the pudding. Once boiled, Ruth will hang the pudding in the pantry until the Christmas feast. Hi, this is Sharon. Hi, pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. To go forward, it's... Gee up! Gee up, lad! Sharon's been driving horses all her life, so before leaving Clumper with the boys, she gives them a driving lesson. And what about left to right, then? Left and right, we don't. I don't have any actual voice commands for that. Right. It's just a case of pulling the reins, whichever way you want to go, and just to give a bit of incentive. Right. Yeah, you find if you over, you, get a bit, you go a bit too fast. Right. If that's the case, you just pull gently on the reins and steady, right. steady. And yes. And do you do you talk to him all the time, or? I tend to. Yeah. I mean, people might think I'm mad, but it just lets the horse know you're still there. Um, yeah. It's just like a little bit of contact, isn't yeah. it? Words of love. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> bit of pressure to the reins. Whoa. OK, ready for a go? Yes, yes. There we are. Right, OK. That's you, it. Remember uh, to keep your hands nice and relaxed. Yeah, and the overhand grip. You still want a little... You haven't even started and he's <laughs> already backseat driving. Terrible. These right. backseat drivers. <laughs> so I've got the right grip. That's it. And it's... Uh, Gee up. <laughs> Gee up. Good boy. That's it. How am I doing then? You're doing very well. Yes. Very well indeed, yeah. yes. Brilliant. Working with horses is an essential skill for the Victorian farmer. So Alex and Peter need to get to grips with Clumper as quickly as possible. Christ knows what these sheep think. Mad. <laughs> At the cottage, Ruth has spent the last few evenings secretly sewing in her bedroom. I'm embroidering a pair of braces for Peter for Christmas, and he obviously, I need to do it when he's not looking, so I've been doing it quietly upstairs um, in the evening, but that means doing it by oil lamp, which is, is just so difficult. I mean, light is so critical. Those of us who are used to having electric lights at the touch of a button, we just forget how much daylight shapes what you can and can't do. So in the winter, when you're struggling and every job has to be fitted within the time scale, and you have to really prioritise, what can I do when I can see? It shapes your whole day and your whole work pattern. And it's not just the light that's the problem. I'm afraid I can't do much more than about an hour up here of a night, no matter how hard I try. I just, I just get so cold that I go so stiff and my fingers get so numb that I just can't carry on.
Unlike Ruth's bedroom, it's important the pigsties are warm and draft-free for the comfort-loving pigs. Alex's brother Tom, who has worked as a 21st century tiler, is using a Victorian technique to seal the roof. Well, I haven't used this tiling technique before, which is bedding each one of these tiles on. As it's going on, you can see the benefits it's going to have for the, uh, for the pigs. See, these tiles are going to be kept onto each other as the cement goes off, restricting any draft or any movement of the tiles. Inside, Peter seals the tiles with cement using a technique known as torching. Torching essentially is like your modern day fiberglass loft lagging to insulate. All I'm doing is putting mortar on the insides between the battens and it, the mortar will curl in into the tile, meet up with the mortar Tom's already put between the tiles and uh, it will form a, a wind barrier, it will form a key to lock them on so tiles won't come off, it will keep it insulated, warm, uh, draft free and it will keep the pigs very happy I think. At the cottage, Ruth is preparing a rather gruesome dish for the Christmas meal. Cow's tongue. He's been boiling for ages and ages and ages. Oh, he's, he's nice and soft. Here he comes. What I've got to do now is skin him. Just get it for skin. Neat as I can. Often used to pad out other things on the table. There we are. Peels off nice. Once we've got the edges off. Makes a nice contrast to poultry. Stronger flavours on the table. Like that angle. Now the final touch to keep the tongue nice and upright, ready for the table. Oh, yes, that looks ridiculous, doesn't it? Come on. Come on, Iris. Come on, that's it. Ruth is keen to get the dairy up and running to make cheese and butter. But to do this, they need milk. So Alex has brought in two new additions to the farm. This one here, forget me not, she's in calf and she'll drop that in May. So we've just got to make sure all of that goes smoothly, drops the calf, it's fine, it's healthy, and we can bring that on. And of course, we'll have a milker then as well. So it's very important that we have a cow, a milking cow, because obviously there's an inordinate amount of dairy that we'd like to do. The one thing it, it just takes is daily dedication, you know, coming in here two or three times a day, li at least. Cows are kept inside over winter, so they must be fed twice a day by the team. Alex has prepared their feed in the machine room. What I've got in today's mix is some uh, sliced roots, but I've also got some, uh, some of the milled oats as well. But the final ingredient would be some roughage. Because we've cleared out the hayloft and we've now got it stacked with hay, what I'll do is probably just drop some hay down from these shoots here. These shorthorn cows were popular with Victorian farmers as they mature and fatten quicker than the older longhorn breeds. Of course, this increased profits. For the period, these are sort of spot on. They really are sort of stalwart of the, um, the British livestock industry in the 19th century. We should check to see what Henry Stevens has got to say about it in uh, our Bible for the year, the Book of the Farm. According to the Book of the Farm, shorthorns were bred to perfection by the Colling brothers in the early 1800s. And here, Henry Stevens reveals the secret of their success. What he likes to put it down to is what we call inbreeding. Okay, so that's breeding um, related beasts that have that have distinctive, uh, desirable features. Okay, so that you sort of you uh, accentuate those features in in the offspring. By the time they'd finished developing the beast, we ended up with a cow which is both a good milker and very good for beef cattle as well. So, for us on the farm, it's really the ideal cow, it's what I'd like to call the sort of first real dual purpose cow. And it was an incredibly popular cow. It was the first cow to make over 100 pounds. But long before genetic engineering, Stevens questioned the safety of playing with nature. 
according to the manner in which it is directed, is possessed of great power for good or evil. So that's quite interesting, uh, his comments there on, on inbreeding and obviously the dangers of inbreeding. Christmas is approaching and Ina's being prepared for the festive lunch. You have tough skin, you have, Ina. And she's still nice and warm, which does make the job a lot easier than trying to pluck a cold bird. And she is in nice condition. The skin's really good. If you've reared a beast yourself and um, then gone through all the processes of preparing it and turning it to the pot, you take time to taste things, um, to notice flavours and textures, and you just get more pleasure out of eating. I've finished doing most of the plucking, but you always get up these last tiny little fluffy bits that are really hard to pull out, so the quickest way of doing it is just to singe it off with a flame. The farmers all do their bit for Christmas, so Alex heads out onto the estate in search of a tree. So it's a bit of the old and a bit of the new for us this Christmas. As far as the old's concerned, we're going to be getting in some holly and some ivy and some yew, traditional greenery with which to adorn the homestead. But for the new, we're getting in our Christmas tree. And this is a fad that really takes off in the Victorian period. In 1848, the Illustrated London News printed this picture of the royal family gathered around a Christmas tree, a tradition brought from Germany by Prince Albert. And of course, when the British public get to see this, of course, everyone wants a Christmas tree. Here we go, not far off. There we go. At the cottage, Ina's stuffed and ready to be roasted, using state-of-the-art Victorian technology. I've got a marvellous new contraption to help me. It's a, I've called a bottle jack, and it's made of clockwork, and that's going to turn the meat for me. And then this screen around it is often called a hastener because it reflects the heat back and speeds up the cooking. So it's a bottle jack and hastener. Like in a kebab shop, when you, you, know, you see that, that, that heated grill and then there's the, the, the kebab twists in front of it, that's how we always used to roast meat, in front of a sheet of flame. So here we go, I'm going to wind up the bottle jack. And then if I started off by giving the meat a little twist just to get it going, and you should hear it click and then it'll turn back the other way. There we go. Now all I've got to do is move it round. And I should be able to come back to it not too often. Leave me space to do the rest of the cooking. been a couple of months, they've been cold, they've been wet, they've been snowy, they've sometimes been sunny, but we've finally finished our pigsties, and I think they look absolutely fabulous. I'm actually genuinely really, really excited. Such a sense of achievement, really. But before the pigs can move in, the styes must be approved by the landlord of the Acton Scott estate, Thomas Acton. Good afternoon. Afternoon. They have built this pig star. At noon, on the dot, he arrives to inspect them. The height measures up to the recommendations of Henry Stevens. He comes equipped with the Victorian farming bible, Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm. For a breeding sty, each apartment should not be less than six feet square. <laughs> Lucky we made that one slightly bigger. <laughs> Shall we, we measure them? We... We, we might want to measure them. What have we got there? Two... Feeling four, a bit nervous at the moment. Five feet. Six. And another foot there, seven. So the styes are big enough, but what about their living quarters? And the floor oh. consists of... Bottles in the floor. I think it could be very comfortable for the pig. So do you approve, Mr Acton? Well, I think it's... Uh, it, it measures up to uh, what Henry Stevens suggests. 
Yeah. And it looks very well built, extremely solid, and fits in well with the uh, other buildings around it. With the act and seal of approval, the final job is to lay a stone carved with Thomas Stackhouse Acton's initials. 2007. <laughs> 106 years late, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's quite as heavy as it looks. What do you think of the stone, Mr Acton? I think it's slightly tilted. <laughs> <laughs> the pig stones or the stone? <laughs> The pigs have arrived, but show little interest in their splendid new home. Come on. One at a time might be a bit, three of them. Well, they're young, they're like teenagers. Like, yeah. <laughs> Peter may have mastered shepherding sheep, but pigs are a different matter. They're an unruly bunch. They really are. Come on, home time. Here you go. You as well. These are our sort of teenager Tamworth pigs, and they're our first addition to these pigsties. They're really good for their bacon. They're the most yeah. attractive things, yeah. aren't they? I mean, as pigs go, I think that they're the prettiest. You're saying that because they're ginger. Because <laughs> they're oh, Thank you. Yes, yes. Can't possibly be more gorgeous than ginger, can you? No. <laughs> it's Christmas Eve. Ruth is putting the finishing touches to the decorations before tomorrow's meal. Nowadays, many people put trees up weeks and weeks and weeks before Christmas, and you have this huge long run up. But the Victorians didn't. Christmas trees came in really much, very much at the last minute. Um, often Christmas Eve itself. Although the Christmas tree is new, um, bringing greens into the house was something that goes, well, it goes back so far, you can't even find the beginnings of it. Anything that was green and looking lively, you know, just to brighten the place up. As evening falls, Clumper transports the farmers to the Acton Scott Church for the Christmas carol service. It's a chance for Alex to show off his new driving skills. It's cold on my hands, this. I'm going to have to knit you some granny imagine. gloves. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to borrow mine? No, I'm all, I'll be all right. Sure? I'll be all right until we get to the church. Okay. I mean, I imagine the church back in the late 19th century would have been brimming with people. I think Acton mm. Scott had something around, something of 150, 180 people used to live at yeah, Acton Scott. Yeah, within this And parish. now you're looking at a handful. Yeah. yeah. Good boy. Alex hasn't quite perfected that left turn yet. Whoa. In the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution brought great change to the British countryside. Many rural people feared that their way of life was being eroded. So Christmas saw a resurgence in popularity as they sought to maintain a sense of tradition. Customs, sometimes dating back to medieval times, were reinvented, and old carols revived, often with new melodies put to old words. Christmas. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's Christmas morning. Before the guests arrive, it's time to exchange presents. Who's, <laughs> who's a lucky boy? Oh. They are superb. <laughs> where, where, oh no, I was just going to say, where are the lederhosen? <laughs> <laughs> Until the 1850s, Christmas presents were usually just given to children. But with the creeping commercialism of the late 1800s, adults too began exchanging gifts, though often they were homemade. Oh, I, feel like I'm, I feel like I'm two years old again. Yeah. 
this looks suspiciously. Well, for me, it sums up Christmas. Looks suspiciously book like. And I know you like I, it. I do like books. Oh, it is a book. It is. Oh, fantastic! Christmas Carol. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, published in 1843, coincided with the inventions of the cracker, the Christmas card, and the popularity of the Christmas tree. It just sort of captures the mood of everything everybody was thinking about Christmas. It just sort of like hits the crest of the wave and catapults it's, it's the whole the, Victorian ideas. The Victorian Christmas in a yeah. nutshell, really. Family, celebrations, charity, all yeah. in one. Place. And a sort of nostalgic element yeah. to it as well, and the, yeah. and the sentimentality of it all. Happy Cheers. Christmas. Yeah. Happy Christmas. To Dickens, Christmas was all about feasting and getting together. It's late afternoon, and with the animals tended to, the team settled down for Christmas lunch, joined by friends and neighbours. And a very special guest, landlord Thomas Acton's son, Rupert. Visitor oh, has arrived. The door. Mr. Acton ah. Jr., please come through. Hi, Alex. We've prepared you a seat here at the end of the table. Thank you very much. I thought indeed. you wanted to take it. I brought you a Christmas card and a small gift. Ooh. Oh, brilliant. Oh, oh, thank you very much. It is. I'll give the oh, card to you. Oh. oh, isn't that lovely? So, what do you think of the free range turkey? Tastes mm. very happy. <laughs> very ha happy meat. Definitely. Happy meat. How free range was it? Very, yes, mm. mostly down the lanes, mm. next door that, fields. Yeah. <laughs> Tiny bit for you. I hope we've authentically recaptured the essence of the Victorian Christmas, the love of the past, the nostalgia, the sentimentality, as well as just bringing all your friends and your family together for a nice big feed up, celebration and wind down. Let's have a Christmas toast. Mm. Cheers, everybody. Yeah. Happy Christmas. Cheers. Cheers. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. <laughs> Okay. Whoa, 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 sorry. We haven't touched the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame not to try it. It really would. Okay. Step up, Peter. It almost looks like a patchier tongue. It's a bit like pastrami and, and parma mm. ham. What do you think? That's lovely. Yeah. It's lovely. It's just like quite a dry steak. What a fine way to go, eh? Being appreciated by people. Here we go. Anybody else? Yes, please. Oh, I'm glad you're doing this, not me. Christmas pudding is uniquely British and central to the Victorian Christmas feast. <laughs> Whee! Here we go. Watch out, watch out. Oh, yes. Now that Wonderful. is Christmas pudding. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow. Can I help somebody do some Christmas pudding? Just pillory. In the days before recorded music at the flick of a button, people still found music very important to them and therefore went to quite big effort to have it around them. They would uh, visit music halls and concerts and they would also make their own music at home. God rest you merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Women's magazines always came with songs and sheet music in as part of the, the magazine. Popular music, people making their own music, was a part of our tradition. And in a way, perhaps recorded music has sort of squashed a bit of the music out of us. Comfort and joy, comfort and joy, all tidings of comfort and Making your own entertainment wasn't just limited to music. Unlike the modern British family that would sit down to, say, something like Zulu or Mary Poppins of a Christmas afternoon, what we're going to do is indulge in a bit of Victorian parlour games. And they were real fans of their parlour games. The game we've opted to play is Shadow Buff. So, without further ado, I will call down the first contestant. Can we have the first contestant, please? Peter must guess who is standing behind the sheet. Of course, it's made more difficult by some rather cunning disguises. <laughs> My word. <laughs> OK, here we go, Peter. Raise the bucket. Looks vaguely Egyptian. <laughs> Looks vaguely Egyptian. <laughs> it could be an obvious one. No, Ruth. I go with Ruth. You're going to go with Ruth? Oh. <laughs> I was going to go with Tom! <laughs> oh, no! Oh, no! 
This is exciting. I have to admit, this compares really very favourably to sitting down of a Christmas afternoon and watching a movie. <laughs> okay, we have our fifth contestant oh, oh. in place. <gasps> what fearsome beast lies behind the sheet, Peter? Do a little jig for us, <laughs> mystery guest. <laughs> oh. What's your name? Don't tell him, Paul. <laughs> Did you say Paul? <laughs> Paul, I was going to go Paul, Paul, Paul it is. Oh, it's Andy, isn't it? It is. It's Paul! <laughs> that was uh, a very good game, although I think I lost quite painlessly. <laughs> it is terribly hard to tell all these people apart. <laughs> good night. <laughs> oh, somebody give me some more gin. <laughs> Here in Shropshire is a farm that's frozen in time, lost in Victorian rural England. Now a unique project has brought it back to life, as it would have been in the 1880s. A time that saw a revolution in British agriculture. Centuries-old skills were under threat from industrialised farming. It was the crossroads between the old and the new. Well, I'm just trying to keep this thing in a straight line. For a full calendar year, Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn are reliving the life of the Victorian farmer. Four months into the project, they've planted a wheat crop in a long abandoned field. Spent weeks restoring their cottage to its former glory and got to grips with a host of traditional breeds. So all, all, all round, this is a, a pretty good shire. Now it's January, and the farm needs emergency repairs. But with no DIY shops, the team is forced to go back to basics, with the help of the blacksmith, the basket maker, and the woodsman. The wheat crop comes under attack, so it's time to master the art of pest control. There's one. Victorian style. The reality of life without modern comforts starts to bite. It's pretty cold. And with spring around the corner, the first baby animals are due to arrive. You're going to go for this, yeah? Yes. It's New Year on the Victorian farm. Ruth and Peter are welcoming a very important new resident. Go on, girl. That's a good girl. Princess is a Gloucestershire old spot, a favourite breed of Victorian farmers. She's pregnant. The team is hoping she'll produce a litter of piglets in a few weeks' time. An enormous bucket of swill waiting for you, lady. <laughs> if they can convince her to move in, that is. Nothing as obstinate as a pig who doesn't yeah. want to go. Good girl. <laughs> Come on. Good girl. Good girl. I think we might need a little bit of bribery and corruption. Oh. Always a mango when you fancy a mango. Yeah. Well, oh, hallelujah. Thing. There we go. You're a gorgeous pig, aren't you? Are you going to give us lots of lovely little piglets? Yeah, yeah. Delicious. Pardon. Richard Lutwich is president of the Gloucestershire Old Spot Society. So how many do you think she's going to give us, then? I'd be ha quite happy if she had eight or nine. Uh, oh, it's still quite a more. lot, isn't yeah, it? She, she might have uh, ten or twelve. Oh, gosh. So what sort of things should we look out for? Think what can go wrong? Very little, really. I mean, uh, pigs are much easier than other farm animals. It's like shelling peas. Just let her get on with it, basically, uh, and hopefully everything will be all right. Peter built these pigsties himself. With Princess moved in, they're finally complete. She only just fits under that door. Slight design error there, I think. <laughs> She's huge, isn't she? With all this new livestock around, the farmyard's becoming a little chaotic. <laughs> Come on, you two. Out. Come on, get away. Mind that duck, Ruth. The real troublemakers are the pigs. If the doors are open, the pigs get out. They either frighten the cows, hello, or they eat the eggs. They get into the nests and eat the eggs. 
So Peter's set himself a major new challenge. What we need to do is we need to devise a way of controlling our stock. So we've got our farmyard, we've got our stackyard, and it makes sense to divide it in half. So essentially what we need is a fence. And then these guys can be free to run around without interfering with the cows and the ducks and what we're working on. In the Victorian countryside, you couldn't necessarily buy a ready-made fence from a shop. Peter is going to have to make one from scratch. He's called an expert, Damien Goodburn, one of the handful of people alive today who study the craft of Victorian woodsmen. Together, they must track down the right tree to make the fence. Right, well, what we're looking for is uh, some oak, an oak tree which will provide the main gate post and then some smaller logs that can be split to make the post and rail fence. In the 19th century, estates could make big money from selling their timber, so woodland like this would have been carefully managed. What, what sort of thickness are we looking for? Well, we want something that's manageable by hand, not too big. We're not trying to fell a valuable big tree that could be sawn up to make furniture or for boat building, sure. that kind of thing, the Victorian period. If they allow a fairly straight one like this to grow big, then it, it, it becomes something, it's, it's almost like money, an investment almost, yeah. money in the bank. Damien's very picky about his trees. And there's this one here. Yeah, but that's, that's uh, a bit too small. A little small, bit bendy. This one here is a tiny bit small, a bit oval. It's a bit sinuous. How about that one? There's another one up there. Well, there's one up here which would be a good tree to use because it'll never make a brilliant timber tree. So with any luck, we might be able to get it down. So all in all, this is our tree. Being very careful not to hit the ground. And the first stage is to square off the base of the tree with an axe ready for sawing. OK. <laughs> we have problems. We'll, we'll use the axe to start it. Now, that's all right. You're going to need to go a little bit to your left, slowly. Don't push the saw, just let it glide itself in. A bit like rowing the Atlantic. A little bit like rowing, yeah, it is, isn't it? And if I did this regularly, I wouldn't be as fat as I am. <laughs> because uh, you don't see many pictures of fat Victorian woodsmen. The falling tree could easily get snagged in the dense branches of the forest. So Peter and Damien try to make sure it falls into a gap. To do this, Damien makes a triangular cut, facing the path they want the tree to take. And this is going to encourage the tree to fall in the direction we want it to go That's in. certainly the theory, <laughs> and I hope the theory's correct. Then it's back to sawing the other side to meet up with the cut. How far now? Um, uh, still a bit more on your yeah. side then. Hang on, hang on. She's going. Get her out. <laughs> that's what we were trying to avoid. Oh, well. That's what we were worried about, and we didn't quite succeed in making it go where we wanted it to. Now what we've got to do is get it to go that way. If we have the smaller axe, and we'll cut the hinge on that side, So at the moment, Damien's just going to chip away and hopefully it will roll around the tree and fall down where we want it to go. Can you come here and give us a push? Oh, go on, you bastard. This is what we need a pole for now. Have we got any poles around here? Oh, you bastard. How much more does that need? Hear it moving now? <laughs> Don't worry. Ginger beer required. <laughs> Finally. After a famous five hour struggle. <laughs> Thank you.
Back in October, Alex toiled for weeks to sow a wheat crop in the farm's long abandoned field. But now the weeds have been conquered, there's a new enemy to face, of the feathered variety. One of my worst fears has been realised here and we've obviously had the birds in here. The last few days as I've been passing, um, there's been a group of pheasants on this patch in particular. And I think what they're doing is they're sort of tugging at the top of this, the, um, the leaves here and then pulling out and having a nibble on the grain. In the Victorian countryside, tenant farmers like Alex often struggle to stop pheasants eating their crops. The birds were raised for shooting parties and every single one was the landlord's property, not to be touched. If a tenant farmer killed one, he could be arrested for poaching. Now, Alex finally has the chance to get his own back. Land agent Rupert Acton has invited him to come along on a pheasant shoot. But first, he's got to make some preparations. Victorian style. Well, one thing I've really noticed over the past couple of months, it's been so wet that the ground is just like a morass. There's just mud everywhere, and my boots have been getting soaking wet. So what I've got to do is get them waterproof because we've got a big day coming up, we've got the shoot. Alex is using a 19th century shoe polish recipe containing beeswax, tar and tallow, a form of beef or mutton fat. Now I've no idea as to what quantity I should be putting in here but I'm going to do it by feel. The first thing to go in is the beeswax which has melted down nicely. I know that we're going to really want more tallow in. That's having an interesting effect, actually. That's almost sort of turning like a, like a paste in there already. Give that a bit of a stir. So we just do that. Now, this is great because it's actually turning into a sort of dark tan boot polish here. And I think it's wet enough, or at least it's warm enough, to start to try apply to the boots. Moment of truth. Let's get it on there. That's going on really thick, actually. I can see the bees wet. I'm going to really work it in. I'm very excited about the shoot. Um, in the late 19th century, the shooting parties were getting bigger and bigger. There's more game about, so the friction between gamekeepers and tenant farmers was at its peak. And it's perfectly understandable, really. You know, if there's birds out there and they're, you know, they're eating your crops, you're going to want to obviously find one for the pot. In the forest, Peter and Damien are dividing the tree into logs. After the exhausting task of felling it, now comes the real challenge. Good lad. Well, the chaps are going to need uh, some help lifting these logs out of the forest, and who better to do it than Clumper? It's the first time he's ever had a go at this. It's called tushing, basically dragging or skidding a log out of the forest. So, so say it's his first time. He's not too sure about the environment, but uh, let's see how he gets on. One log ready to tush. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. We'll give him a little go. Gee up. Come on. Okay, you're against the tree. Two, three. This log weighs around 300 kilograms. That's the equivalent of three baby elephants. That's it. Good boy. He's going well, isn't he? He is. It's not as if it makes a difference to him uphill or downhill. No, he, he actually quite likes sort of getting stuck into it. Come on. Last bit of hill. Come on, boy. I need to make these things look like matchsticks. I struggle to walk at the pace that Clumper touches uphill. Clumper is heading for the estate saw pit where the log will be cut up for use in the farmyard fence. Good boy. Come on, keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming. And whoa, he's done very well. I'm quite surprised, actually. I thought there'd be more problems. Getting it out there in the, uh, out of the, uh, that, that steep slope right at the beginning was a bit difficult, and the guys had to roll it. But otherwise, took it in his stride. And it never ceases to amaze me how easily he takes the jobs. 
Oh, uh, he's even listening, you see. Working outside all day is tough on the Victorian farmer's body. But in small villages, there wasn't always access to off-the-shelf remedies for aches and pains. At the cottage, Ruth's been looking into some homemade solutions. I'm going to make a cream for chat cans. So I've got some lard here and I've been just softening it and then whisking it with a fork so that it's light and fluffy. So now I'm going to add the honey. Not so runny. Fairly runny. And a little oatmeal. The texture of the oatmeal will make it very slightly sort of scrubby when you when you um, putting it on, which will help to massage the whole cream into the skin. And now I need egg yolks. And then the last thing I need to put in is some rose water, which is just distilled water and oil of roses. And that adds not only a beautiful scent, but also adds to its absorbability into the skin. And whisk. Storage is not a problem. Because of all the fat in it, I just have to pop it in a jar, pop a lid on, and it'll keep three, maybe four months with no problem. So you've got to get all the calls right. Yes. OK. Probably a few more wood. The day of the pheasant shoot has arrived. Peter and Alex are taking up their position as beaters, flushing the birds out of the woods. The sport of pheasant shooting as we now know it was invented in the late 19th century. Prince Albert and his sons were big fans of shooting, but they had a problem. Traditionally, shooting parties tried to sneak up on the pheasants, which meant most of the birds got away. So a new technique evolved, employing beaters to drive the game towards the guns, with a series of calls. We've all got to hold a line as we walk through this copse and make as much noise, really, as possible. I can't hear you making much noise, Peter. <laughs> Peter, let's hear you calling. <laughs> For land agent Rupert Acton, Shooting runs in the family. My great-grandfather, Augustus Wood Acton, uh, lived here in the late 19th century, and uh, he shot uh, about once a week, and there would have been about four guns um, and, uh, and four or five beaters. Um, in the 19th century, on this estate, they were probably shot in the region of um, four or five hundred game birds during the shooting season. There's one. There's one, one there. much talking. <laughs> the swampy ground will give Alex's waterproofing efforts a stern test. I'm really impressed with the mix because I've got the uh, job of making my way through the stream here. So it was a godsend that I decided to do it. But Peter isn't quite so lucky. Should have waterproofed your boots, Peter. <laughs> no birds have been shot on this drive, so the beaters must move on to a new wood. I've been having trouble, oh, I do most winters, with chapped lips. As soon as the weather gets cold and wet, my lips go all dry and start to crack and bleed. So therefore I'm making some Victorian lip salve. Um, the recipe say four chapped lips specifically. But quite interestingly, most of them include alkanet, which doesn't do anything for chapped lips. What it is is a dye. Uh, it's a red dye. So I'm hoping that this recipe is going to come out with cherry-coloured lip gloss. Alkanet is a common plant that often grows as a weed. You can use any part of the plant to get some colour, but the root is where the majority of it is. So this is just dried alkanet root. So I've got some olive oil to pour in. What I'm going to do is put the alkanet in the oil and pot it on the um, 
range just to warm through and hopefully the colour then will infuse within the oil. The other two ingredients are mutton fat and white wax. The two have got to be melted together and the Alkanet has done the most fantastic colouring job. It's really done its business, isn't it? If that's not red, I don't know what is. So that's my wax and mutton fat melted. And that goes in with that lot. And then just got to strain them to get all the bits out. Oh yeah, look at the colour on that. The mixture will be kept in a cool place to set. You couldn't buy anything that was more like a red lip gloss than this. And there's nothing nasty in it, is there? The beaters have moved on to a new wood. Peter's encouraging the birds to fly away from him and towards the guns. The technique of driving game quickly became very popular, but with more birds to target, the Victorians needed to shoot faster. Traditionally, loading a gun was a fiddly process, with gunpowder and shot pushed down the barrel. So gunsmiths came up with a cartridge containing everything in one simple package, and a brand new weapon that could be split in two for easy loading. Reloading time was cut from minutes to seconds, and many more birds could be shot. Let's see if we can uh, stake a claim on these uh, birds then. A nice change from farm work. Yes. Yes, that's a bit. With the pheasant shoot over, the beaters have been rewarded for their hard work. Did that bird drop, did it? Couldn't see. See. I was too busy wondering why I hadn't applied waterproof substance to my boots. <laughs> it's February. With fewer pheasants around, the crop has a chance to grow. The farmyard fence is coming on well. Peter's been chopping the log ready for the saw pit. This is why I never owned a skateboard as a child. And Princess, the expectant sow, is settling in nicely. Let's get, let's get them in this pen. If we go down with the bucket to this pen and get them in the pen, we'll have a, a closer look. And... Baby pigs are not the only thing the team is expecting. Call them to you, Alex, that's the way. The big fella at the back. In November, Sheep farmer Richard Spencer lent the team his prize ram, Fred. But though Fred took a fancy to the ewes, Alex isn't quite sure if any of them are pregnant. Come round here, Alex, and I'll show you. So Richard's come back to find out. If a sheep is in lamb, if she's pregnant, what is in the udder now should be wax and sticky. Right. Getting to the udders requires an expert technique. You're going to put your knee in the shoulder so she can't escape, and you're going to put your hand under there, find the teat, and get some wax out and tell them she's in line. Right. <laughs> I'm stuck. Okay. That's okay. it. Now put your hand underneath, find the teat. It's in there somewhere. Right, nothing there. You really want to put your hands gently to the top of the udder and gently just massage it down into the teat. I can't find it, Richard. <laughs> I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> you can do this, Alex. Think positive thoughts. How far apart are these things usually, Richard? Well, at the normal distance, really. One on each side, they come in pairs. <laughs> I'm not getting anything. I'm wondering whether I should get you to teach me to turn them over. Sheep farmers often turn their sheep over to inspect them. But with each ewe weighing up to 10 stone, it can be a challenge. You lock it tight onto your knee, and you literally, keeping it tight on your knee, you just rock backwards with your hand, fingers firmly hooked under that flank, and just rolls over on your knee, onto her butt, onto her rear. It doesn't involve a lot of physical stress on your part, just using the principle of levers and the sheep's weight. It's her. a bit of a sort of judo roll. Lift the head up into the air, let it roll oh. around your knee. 
Yes, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going backwards. Lift it off, drop it. You've done it, that's it. Yeah. And all the rest will be easy after that. Well done. Oh. Oh, look at that patch on that man's face. <laughs> look at that, he'll sleep yeah, well tonight. Now you can get the wax out of that one. Massage it gently from the udder into the teeth. Yes, look, see it filling the teeth now, you see? The teeth's right. full of wax. And then I... The teeth is full of wax. And then... Yeah. Ah. There you are. Ah, there we he are. He is so happy. There we are. One happy camper. Let's try this one. Yeah, we've got to drop. There you oh, go. Oh, well, look yes, at that. There yes. you go. Now then, if you... Listen to that there. Better than sticky tape. Spot on. Wonderful stuff. That is sticky uh, wax. Wow, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. There you are. That is perfect. That sheep is definitely inland. Right, brilliant. Now that's it, you're rolling. Go, keep, keep the The wax is a clear sign that in a few weeks this sheep will be producing milk to feed her young. Now all Alex has to do is check the rest of his flock. You are, young man. Well, thank you very much, Richard. We'll make a shepherd of you yet. Ensuring livestock was well fed over winter was absolutely crucial for the Victorian farmer. Every day, the team processed food for the animals in machines, such as this root slicer. But Ruth has hit a snag. The bucket's entirely the wrong shape, so more time scraping off the floor. There's so many jobs to do, simply can't afford to have inefficient tools. To make a better container, Ruth has asked someone with unique skills to come to the farm. This, uh, this is oak, uh, which was felled just the other day, and I'm going to turn this into a basket. Owen Jones makes a type of basket specific to the Lake District and the West Midlands. Though once common, his profession is now endangered. In Victorian times, there have been hundreds, possibly thousands, of people making these baskets. For many years, I was the only person. Recently, I've uh, taught someone else, so there's now two of us. In Britain, most baskets are made from willow. What makes this basket special is that it uses local materials, oak and hazel. It's a coppiced hazel rod which is going to be the rim of the basket, and I have to smooth it off, ready for bending. Next, Owen prepares the ribs of the basket. Each oak log must be measured up and chopped into strips. This is where we start to get a feel of, of what the wood's like. <laughs> Drive it in. It'll take Owen five hours to make this basket, in the 19th century, oak basket makers got together in small workshops of two or three men, collectively producing dozens of baskets each week. As I'm splitting now, working it down, there is a potentially problem that it can start running off or running out to one side. So I can, I can control that by which, which way I pull the throw, either pull towards me or push against. Once the oak's been cut to length, it's placed with the hazel inside a boiler. When it's finished, Owen's basket will make processing food by hand a much easier task. But on the estate's home farm, Alex and Peter have discovered a brand new way of making food for their flock. OK, engage. OK, engaging now. Throughout the 19th century, the machinery of mass production was making its way onto farms. Excellent. This system of belts and pulleys is over 150 years old. This is our oats bruiser, our kibbler. You can hear it engaging there. Oh, that's a sound, isn't it? The kibbler grinds up wheat grain for the farm's animals to eat. They've all been bruised, they've been crushed. So when they go through the digestive system of the animal, they'll be absorbed more efficiently. All this machinery is powered by the Victorian farm's driving engine. Clumper, the Shire horse. Gee up. That's it. I find this absolutely fascinating because 
all you need is a horse, some hay for winter, keep him well fed, and you've got energy, you've got power, you've got horsepower. The term horsepower was coined by the engineer James Watt. He designed a steam engine, and to market it, he came up with a method to compare its power with that of a horse. The result was a brand new measuring unit, horsepower. Good lad. Every time Clumper goes round once, that wheel up there turns 52 times. So if he works for a week, this works for a year. This truly is the birth of mechanised farming. In the farmyard, Owen Jones is ready to shape the rim of his basket. I'll throw it down initially on the ground. That will take some of the moisture out of it, take a bit of the heat out of it. Hopefully this will bend nicely. I'll put the butt end in first. Be careful around the curve so it doesn't kink. Feels that it's steamed enough. Pulling with my right hand and following with my left hand. Yeah, I'm happy with this one. This, uh, this, looks, this looks pretty good. Next, the oak is removed from the boiler. It's actually a, a wonderful smell. It's just a fruity, like a fruity smell. It's the best part of the day. This process is known as riving. This is quite hot on the hands. If you sometimes you get to a point where your hands start burning and then you have to knock them on your on your knees and that cools them down. The, the simplest way of doing it is this way, and you, you're pulling it down. It's a it's a feel thing. This is really good stuff. It's quite tough stuff. I can I can leave it quite thick and bend it like that. So that'll make good strong baskets. The material is now ready for the final stage. Starting to weave the basket now. It's all woven, there's no fixing, there's no nails, no pins. It's all woven together. These baskets would have been used throughout the 19th century on farms. They're very important, they would be used for broadcast sowing seed, harvesting root crops such as potatoes, feeding animals, chopped turnips. They gradually declined as mechanisation took over. For instance, a wire basket was introduced and tractors came along with the seed drills and there was less hand work on the farms. Wow! God, that looks fantastic! So how long is something like this going to last, then? This basket can last for, for decades. In fact, really? I have... Uh, repaired baskets. I occasionally get them repaired and they've been 50 years old. Wow. Some of the strips go and I can just weave them. Gosh, talk about here. environmentally friendly. Something that you can use for 50 years and then get repaired and carry on using it. Yes, and then you can use it kindling for your fire. Fantastic. Oh, isn't it beautiful? <gasps> that is just a really, really beautiful thing. They give you many years of service and they're, they're really strong. In fact, one of the tests at the end of it, you have to be able to stand on it. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Flipping it. Bounce up and down. It's incredible. Who needs a horse? At the saw pit, Peter and Damien have reached the last and most technically precise stage of the fence post. That's about where we want to be, about there. One, two, three. OK, then just up and down, just a few strokes to get it bedded in. Men employed to saw wood were called sawyers. By the late 19th century, saw pits like this were in decline. Industrial saw mills were taking over, and hand sawing couldn't compete. You come right up and right down. Slow down. Okay, imagine you're doing this all day. It'll take several hours to cut off the sides of this log. A mechanical sawmill could process hundreds in a day. The top of my arms and my shoulders are really starting to ache. Well, as in really <laughs> starting to ache. The constant sweaty exertion of farm life means tending to personal hygiene is a high priority for the team. With Alex and Peter out of the house, Ruth has the perfect opportunity. 
I'm going to have a bath. People in this period felt that washing was seriously the underpinning thing about keeping yourself healthy, despite the fact that it's actually really difficult in this sort of situation to do. Ruth's bath is a sawn-off wooden barrel covered with a sheet. It's almost like a drip tray that catches the water as you pour water over yourself. And it's very, very efficient on resources. Bathing in a room with no central heating, it's pretty cold. A lot of people have the image of a Victorian bath being a large tin affair that um, you can fill up with water and be submerged in up to your neck. But most people in the country who didn't have spare money managed in this sort of shallow tray with wiping yourself down, soaping yourself all over and pouring water over you. So somewhere between a shower and, um, and a scrub down. Peter and Damien have been sawing for almost four hours. As night falls, the race is on to finish the gatepost. You're getting the hang of this, Peter. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Like you say, it's very zen. Is it? <laughs> Wedge always falls on the head of... <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is our third side of our post. Just before bed, Ruth's trying out her homemade remedies. So this is the hand cream I made earlier with rose water and lard and oatmeal. And it definitely helps. But I don't think anything would, you know, completely protect your hands from the amount of cold water and hard work. And this lip gloss, however, is absolutely fantastic. There's one more hygiene challenge that Ruth must tend to. I'm just making up some more sanitary towels. Back in the Victorian period, of course, you couldn't just nip down the shops when you needed such supplies. You have a bag um, which can be washed and then you stuff it with something absorbent. So, for example, if there was a load of nice dry moss outside, I might use that to stuff the bags with. And you just pop whatever it is you're going to stuff inside the bag, and there you go, one sanitary pad, and that sort of sorts out that monthly problem. It's often these sort of intimate little details about people's personal lives that I find most fascinating. History's full of all the big stuff, but, you know, the details, the day-to-day, -day, just how you manage, often gets forgotten and left by the wayside. March has arrived and the farm is showing the first signs of spring. Ruth's basket is being put to use. Fantastic! Hello pigs, you ready? Done off, make life easier. Peter's gatepost is finally in the ground. All right. And all ten ewes are pregnant. Lambing time is now imminent. The boys have travelled to Richard Spencer's farm to get some much-needed advice. How are you? How are you going? Oh, steady, steady. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Yeah, so you're going to give us a crash course today? Have you lambed a sheep before? Never. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one here. We have a nose and two front feet. You can tell with the front feet. Well, I could pull this out as easy as pie. But as you've never done it before, who's going to go first? Who wants to learn? I'll give it a go. You can give it a go. Right, Alex, the trick is, if you're on your own, which you often are working with livestock, yep. the, the, the sheep is on the side, everything's OK. You get close in with your knees inside of the stomach, so if she kicks and struggles, which she might do, she's not going to kick you where it hurts. And you don't look with your eyes, you look with your fingertips. So just hand straight in? Yeah, right? straight in there. There's plenty of lubricant provided by Mother Nature. 
Okay. Don't look with your eyes, look with your fingertips. So not looking with my eyes, right. It's a very big lamb. So why is she taking so long? Why she needs help? Don't be afraid to pull. Yeah. Go on, really give it some. Go okay. for it. Got it? Yeah, here it comes. Go, 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 go. Go, go, go. Both hands, just don't mess about because it'll, it'll grip right. the umbilical cord. Keep going. Both hands if you wish, Alex. Go, 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 go. Get him out. Get the placenta off his head. His head's covered with placenta. Clear it. Yeah. Use your fingers to squeeze his nose and clear the mucus off his nose just to get everything clear. Yeah. Right. Put your finger and thumb, middle finger and thumb, on his ear and prick it really tight. Get the nails to rub together okay. either side of his ear. Nails into here, like that's that. it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. good, that's a gasp. Still not very strong. Grab some straw, grab some straw. Okay. That's it. And scrub his chest. In there. No, you're playing with it, man. You're scrubbing the floor. Really, really rub it. Get the circulation going. Really what? stimulate him. Yeah. It's like an aggressive mother sort of licking him to get him going. Yeah. That's it. That's the first lamb you've actually delivered, is it, Alex? That is the first lamb I've ever delivered. That's fantastic. <laughs> look at him. You also check that there's milk there, look. Little, it's important. Little. That's oh, it, yeah. perfect. All over me, yep, yeah. wonderful. See if that works as well. Oh, oh spot look. on. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> oh, absolutely wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Now we've got this sheet with a healthy lamb all looking like it's sucking well. Just pen her up so that no other sheet comes along and takes the lamb away from her. Anywhere you like, up the wall side. Use the corner of the wall there to wedge the end of the hurdle again so it won't move away then. Just remember where the sheet puts the pressure, where she pushes against it. When you're working with sheep, you have to think like a sheep. And she's taking the, the oh, lamb's taking that milk. Now. That's what I love about the Shropshire sheep. The lambs have got that wonderful tenacity, that wonderful will to live. As soon as they're out there, and we struggled to get the breath, first breath in that lamb, didn't we, yeah, Alex? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful sheep, the Shropshires. They really want to get up and go. And it's been a real barrage of emotions. Um, they've certainly given me confidence <laughs> for our own lambing, but um, there's still part of me that's very apprehensive, very nervous because when we're away from here, when we're back on our farm, we won't have Richard, we won't have the backups, we'll be on our own. And, you know, what if something goes wrong, will we be able to cope? With the first lambs due in just a few days, Peter will soon have a chance to find out. But before the lambs are born, the sheep field needs urgent repairs. There's a big hole in the hedge surrounding it, which Ruth has decided to fix using an ancient technique called wattle work. I'm just driving some posts in along this gap in the hedge and then I'm going to weave a load of hazel up and down. The early spring or late winter is a time when you do as much of the sort of hedging and ditching as you possibly can. There's not too much other agricultural work and there's no leaves on the wood to get in your way. I expect the vegetation just to sort of grow up around this bit, so this should solve the gap for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years maybe, if I'm lucky. To test her repairs, Ruth's drafted in the farm's most consistent escape artists. Jump through. <laughs> Go on, try and get through my fence now. Well, it's only a very quick bit of emergency fence mending, but I think that'll do. The fence across the farmyard is far from complete. To speed things up, the boys are going to cut the rest of the logs by cleaving. We're putting in wedges that's forcing the wood apart. I mean, there's no question about this being a thousand times quicker than sawing. It's a rough and ready form of fencing. It's got to be functional. It doesn't necessarily have to be pretty. Be like us. Play the wedges. Oh, look at that, it's just gone. This, there we are. Yeah, I, th I think the key is putting the axe in at the start and dictating how it's going to split. I think the key is <laughs> after we've done the job. <laughs> if only you were so smart before the job, Peter. Back in the farmyard, the quartered logs must be cut down by two feet. That's good. How big's two? I will use my Victorian <laughs> measuring stick. This is a foot from elbow. There we are, to that knuckle there. So if I mark that up there, to there, it's this mark here. 
Getting a nice rocking action going here. Yeah, you use a lot more of your body weight with saw like this. So this is going in this hole just here. Okay. It's still going. Look at all that water coming out. The fence needs a gate, and a gate needs hinges. On the farm's estate, there's only one man for the job. John Herbertson is the local blacksmith. Blacksmiths uh, rather pride themselves on being the possessors of the king of crafts because if the blacksmith couldn't make the tools and the carpenter couldn't cut his wood, the wheels on the carts wouldn't be shod and no one could do anything. So um, the blacksmith would have been a man of some importance and his, uh, I suppose his contribution would have been to drag everybody in to the, the village blacksmiths. There'd be farmers there parking their horses to be shod, carts to be mended, and uh, also in the winter, of course, it'd be the one warm place around. By the late 19th century, the village blacksmith's trade was declining. Competition from factories meant many of their products were being mass-produced by machines at much lower cost. Items like hinges, nails and wagon parts could be purchased ready-made. What I'm doing is, is rolling it up, a bit like a Swiss roll. But unlike other rural craftsmen, many blacksmiths survived into the 20th century. They took on work for the railways, and when automobiles began to appear, some became mechanics. Hi, John, have you finished the hinges? Yes, I have, it's done now. So the gate will open that way. That's absolutely perfect. Thank you very much, I'm very, very impressed. The fence is almost finished, but before they can complete it, the team have a new problem to tackle. The wheat crop is once again under attack, not from pheasants this time, but from rabbits. Just like game birds, rabbits were the property of the landowner. For much of the 19th century, it was illegal for tenant farmers to kill them. So Alex has decided to take matters into his own hands, in the style of a notorious figure of the Victorian countryside, the poacher. Going out on the pheasant shoot was very much something we did with the land agent, but um, catching rabbits like this is, is, is something that you, you'd do as a poacher, you know. You just certainly wouldn't want to let the land agent know about this. Doug and Bob Jones are a father and son team. They've been catching rabbits in these hills for 50 years using ferrets. Net this all. What you do is you net up all of the holes and then you put the ferret in. And we've got a Jill, which is a female ferret. She runs around and, of course, she puts the fear of God on the rabbits. They shoot along the burrows and they come out. And these nets are designed in such a way that as the, as the rabbit hits them, it sort of it traps them behind. Poaching was widespread in Victorian Britain and the authorities took a very serious line. Game laws throughout the 19th century were incredibly strict. Police were issued with stop and search powers, and this was an enormous bone of contention amongst the working classes. In practice, the law meant that um, the police could stop a, stop a farm labourer returning from work and um, ask him to turf out his pockets, and, and, and obviously, if they've got any traps or nets or, or even game, they could be arrested. But, of course, the police then at the time were using these powers just to stop random people and just to, you know, to check to see what they were up to and what they were doing. And, of course, this really upset a lot of farm labourers. OK, we're going to drop the ferrets in. Right. Okay, she's in, so quiet now. The ferret looks in every burrow until she finds a rabbit. If there's none to be found, she'll reappear. Just seen the ferret just stick its head out. Not in here. Boxer? Boxer. Okay, we'll move on. Move on to the next. Move on to the next one? Yeah. Yes. With dozens of warrens in these hills, there are plenty more to try. 
It's a bit of a knit and miss affair, really, and you don't really know where they are. Back at the cottage, Ruth is dealing with the leftover pheasant from Alex's first hunting trip. We had them roasted the other night, but there's quite a lot of meat left on them. I've got here a book about um, how to cook with leftovers. It's called The Family Save-All, and it's marvellously thrifty, and it's, it's full of really interesting recipes. This recipe here is for pheasant, um, hashed pheasant. Waste not, want not. Not only a Victorian saying, but such a Victorian moral. So many people going hungry, and the idea of wasting good food appalls people. If you were a person with not very much spare money, and you lived in London, for example, there were any number of shops where you could buy food leftovers, which would be collected from places like um, hotels or um, gentlemen's clubs, places like that. And for very, very small amounts of money, you could buy such leftovers and take them home and make a dinner out of them. After stripping the bones, Ruth makes a stock in which to stew the leftover meat. Plenty of fox muck about here anyway, so that's a good sign. He doesn't hang about for nothing. No, he doesn't, does he? At the second rabbit warren, hopes are running high. See how she gets on? Can we have some quiet now, please? Leave it, leave it. This leave it, or Doug leave will? It. Leave it, leave it, leave it. Simple case. What there we don't want to do is just broken the neck. It's a start, but they're hoping for many more rabbits. Okay, I'll put her in lower down. There he is, Doug. Good dog, Charlie. Good dog. All right. Good dog. All right. Dead. All right. Leave it. Leave it, leave it, leave it. With the warren exhausted, the final total is six rabbits. And they're quickly put to use back at the cottage. What I'm going to do is a pudding, a rabbit pudding. It's a very rural dish. Suet puddings were an absolute staple for many a Victorian family, particularly at the bottom end of the social scale. They're cheap to make and they're very filling and they're easy to make nice. You'd only need the tiniest touch of flavour and it goes right through them. Now, my pieces of rabbit are to be browned. That's just sort of lightly fried in a little bit of butter. So I'll just lay my pieces of rabbit Now for the suet crust of my rabbit pudding, I've got to make suet crust pastry, which is just flour, a little water, and some fat, suet fat. Now you need about twice as much flour as fat. This isn't posh cooking by any stretch of the imagination. This is simple food, quick to prepare, keeps you going no matter what the weather. In the sheep field, one of the pregnant ewes is showing signs of distress. The boys have decided they must intervene. Come in there. Yeah. Go that side of you. Get her down. Go that way. Get her down. Okay. Shoot the back leg. Right. right. So we're going to go for this, yeah? Yes. We've got some feet there. Feel your fingers. Look away. How about, is it, is it in the right alignment? It is, yeah, the head. Yeah. I can feel the jaw. OK. Yeah. See these fingers, where my fingers are? Yeah. The closing, I can feel the jaw there. So yeah. it's good. It's very well presented. Right. <laughs> 
all the way up. Oh. Right, that's it. Lovely, lovely. See it wipe it down, then it's nose, mucus from its mouth, that's it. Yeah, is it breathing yet? Is it breathing? Yep, yep. That's it, get some hay on it. Give it a rubbed straw, that gets circulation going. Yep. Just pinch its ear, there. Oh, yeah. Yep, that's, that's moving. It's alive, it's alive, yeah. great. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm inclined to get some water to her, get her penned up. Get her penned. And then, um, just sort of, we'll keep we'll monitor overnight, here, yeah? Well, sit here for, sit, sit for an hour and a half, a couple of hours. Just to make sure she's and, all right. And to make sure um, this one gets at the, um, the teats. Yeah. You think, yeah? Yeah. Look, she's, she's trying to stand up as well. That's all good. That's a great sign, to be honest. A great sign. Right. I mean, now she's sitting here and they're both doing fine. I'm, I'm really glad we did it. Yeah, I think we made I'm the really right call. I think, I think we did. Look at that. Look at them. Look at that. I think she's going to try and stand up now. So, time for me to make my exit. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Well, that was quite something. That really was quite something. <laughs> Delicious. This is your rabbit, this is. Right. I'm drooling over your dinner here. Yeah. Leftover pheasant. Leftover pheasants. Oh, that's very, very, very nice. It's a very gamey meal. Yeah. Well, if you will keep going kidding things, <laughs> yeah. you have to eat them. <laughs> a great delight in eating the pheasant, because he's eating our crop. Yeah. Rabbit's nice. The farm's first lamb is doing well. And a little while after she was born, her mum gave birth for a second time. Shropshire sheep can often have twins or even triplets. With the rest of the flock due to give birth soon, the farm's population is set to explode. Just in time, the boys have finally completed the farmyard fence. Having felled the tree, sawn the gatepost, cleaved the rails, and hung the gate with the blacksmith's hinges, it's now time to put their work to the test. Well, we've finished our post and rail fence that divides up our farmyard. John the blacksmith and Ruth have come to inspect it, and I'm going to let out the pigs, Alex is going to let out the cows, and hopefully never the twain shall meet. Come on then, you two. Out you come. There you go. Seems to be working really well. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. I think, it's, I think, I think, for me, it just completes the farmyard now. Like everything is done. Yeah, they all look really sturdy. These posts, they look really good. Well, they are all sturdy, apart from the M one. <laughs>